All right, here we go. Today we have Super Bowl champion and former writer for the hit TV show Ballers, Richard Mendenhall. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, man. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Listen, congrats on a an exceptional career on and off the court. Something that most professional sports players struggle with. Yeah. But it seems like you really found your way. For sure. And we want to get into that, you know, during the whole story, but I just want to congratulate you about it early on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that's something my mom really emphasized. Uh, mm. She didn't want us to like, you know, be like dumb jocks or just like focused on the sport, man, who we are um, off the off the field, being well-rounded, um, being, being uh, focused was always important. That's what's up. So let's start at the very beginning. So you grew up in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, yes. Um, Kind of really grew up in Skokie, Illinois, but was also uh, most of my family, with most of my family on the south side of Chicago. Uh, that's where we went to church and everything. So Skokie, Illinois and south side of Chicago. Uh, okay. And Skokie is like 30 minutes from Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Probably, uh, yeah, yeah. 30, maybe 20, uh, yeah. 15, depending on how you drive. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's pretty close, north suburbs. Um, so it's still Chicago land area. Uh, okay. So what was that area, you know, between south side Chicago in particular, which, you know, has a very storied past. Yes. What was that like in the early 2000s, mid 2000s? Um, you mean like Skokie or just well, kind of both? Let's, let's start with Southside Chicago. Okay. What was that um, like? So, man, it was, um, it's funny. Um, it's like um, my experience there was mostly uh, in the church with uh, my mom being a youth minister, was mostly family and church uh, on the South Side. Like, um, Obviously, um, there's, there's, there, there was a lot of culture there, um, a lot of history. Um, there's, there's gangs and things, but I wasn't exposed to that as much as I was, um, kind of a member in a service in the church because my mom would be different churches helping out. Um, so the South Side was kind of like rich and, and, and storied for us. And, uh, on the Skokie front, going up in Skokie, um, a very multicultural area, like culturally diverse. Um, uh, predominantly originally was a Jewish area neighborhood. Um, but, but as, as, you know, as we were there, different cultures started coming in, setting in. Um, so, and, and we can talk more about that. I know you're asking about Chicago. Uh, okay. Well, uh, mm -hmm. you grew up with both parents, one parent. Um, yes, mostly my mom, uh, single mother, my mother and father were together, um, uh, early on, then they got divorced. Maybe when I was officially, maybe when I was in fifth grade, mm. but they've probably been separated since I was in like first grade or, or second grade. Um, so grew up with my mom, but saw my dad pretty regularly. He, okay. uh, we'd see him every other weekend, uh, visitation. So we still spend time with him. Okay. How many kids are there? Uh, three. Me, okay. my older brother, Walter, and younger sister, Vanessa. Uh, okay. So were you just a natural athletic talent? Like when did the whole football thing really you know, kind of yeah. get on your radar? Um, yeah, I guess it was uh, always there. Uh, I think uh, early on, early on in my life, uh, up until six years old, we lived in Los Angeles a little bit, Culver City. Mm, okay. um, so I was in kindergarten at Culver City. And, and my mom tells this story. I was too young <laughs> to remember. Um, but my kindergarten teacher in Culver City, Miss Audrey, I believe her name was, uh, one of the days my mom uh, showed up to the school and, you know, she pulled my mom aside and she was like, yo, there's something you need to notice. Um, she was like, when, you know, going out on the playground, when most of the kids run, she was like, they kind of like waddle, <laughs> like tell the dummies they're going back and forth. But she was like, when your son runs, he's like, shoom, shoom, like really. So <laughs> she like, she told my mom that and she was like, I, I want to show you, demonstrate. So she had all the kids line up and run. And she said the way I run, that was something that my teacher brought to my mom to take notice of. So I'm guessing it was, it was always there. Okay. So when did you really start to become like a, like a serious standout athlete? Um, was it junior elementary school, junior high? Were you in Pop yeah, Warner? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So literally, um, it, it's funny, man. It's, it's really there from the beginning. Uh, I started playing Pop Warner at Little League, um, going into fifth grade. So when I was 10 years old, okay. from fourth going into fifth. Um, but by the time I got there, I already, I was already like a legend on the playgrounds. <laughs> like, uh, my, my older cousin, Mike Davis, who stayed on the South side, uh, we would go to visit him. And when I kind of really, when, 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 when it let me know was, um, 
when I would go there to visit him, it'd be the older kids in the neighborhood, teenagers and things. When I showed up, they'd be like, hey, hey, he's here. Like, little niggas here. <laughs> like, uh, the kid that can, can play with and they go grab a football and, and, and want to play. To being at uh, recess on the playgrounds, I just always had like a, man, I, I, I play with older kids always. It was always there. So when I when I got to Little League, finally like organized ball from, uh, from the moment I got in, I'd always felt like it's a really great player and then took that and, and it kept going. Okay, so then you went to, well, two different high schools, right? You went to Niles West High School and then Lincoln Junior High School. Oh, okay. oh, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry you went, went to Lincoln yeah. Junior High School first. Yeah, yeah, Junior High. There we go. And I then Niles West. So you went to Lincoln Junior High first, then you went mm -hmm. to Niles West. Yes, yes. Afterwards. Yes, correct. Okay, and in high school, that's when things really started to take off for you. Uh, yes, yes. Oh. Uh, right, you had 1,300 yards and 21 touchdowns as a sophomore. As a yeah. junior, you had 1,832 yards, 19 touchdowns, 1.6 yards per carry. Mm -hmm. As a senior, 9.1 yards per carry, for, uh, rushing at 1,453 yards, 160 attempts, 14 touchdowns. Yeah. So yeah. you were like a major recruit oh, at absolutely. this point. Uh, you actually, you were the best recruit in the whole state of Illinois. Yeah, the number one recruit. By scout.com. State of Illinois, yeah, Chicagoland area, the whole thing. Uh, how um, did it feel to be the number one football player in the entire state in high school um man being a front runner in that way leader um that's kind of never left me and i'd be um man i'd be remiss if i didn't even take a step before that yeah i killed it in in, in high school i i in in junior high in in pop warner in little league man i was a standout like mm. i mean after games after practices there'd be like parents arguing to try and get me a ride home <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> stuff that i noticed i was that star player um i remember a team we played against um i believe it was Winneka, uh one of the other suburbs um and, and i had a run against that team it was crazy got a toss to the right it felt like i shook their whole team <laughs> like got to the end zone and i remember after the game uh playing against Winneka after that game and i'm you know i'm still i'm i'm young but i'm locked in i'm like uh in the zone football so we go to shake hands and I remember slapping the kids' hands from the other team. And we had just won. We had just beat them. And I was like, why are these kids so like happy? They were excited as we were, were shaking hands. And I remember I pulled one of the kids aside. I'm like, yo, because um, I, I was curious. And I'm like, um, like, why? Like, you know, you guys just lost. Like, what are you excited about? They're like, we met an NFL player. They're like, you're like Barry Sanders. You're going to be Barry mm -hmm. Sanders. So in Little League, one of the kids said, like, you're going to go and be Barry Sanders. Everybody was excited because they met somebody that was going to the next level, like this to the, to the ultimate level. And it's funny that um, when they said that, I'm like, oh, damn, you're probably right. I knew it then. I, I knew it then where I was going. Well, right. You were on the cover of Sporting News High School Football Magazine. Yes, yes, correct. So you're already making covers in high school. Absolutely. Absolutely. At what point did you know you were going to the NFL? Was it that moment you just described or was it earlier? It's, man, it's, it's even earlier. Um, it, for me, like going to the NFL, it wasn't a goal. It was just something I always knew I was going to do. Mm. Um, I like uh, be before Lincoln Junior High, being at Edison or no Madison. I was in first grade. This is a kindergarten, first, second grade school. I was in first grade, uh, which means you would be age six. And in gym class, they have like you know the little fitness tests and where you, you know, they had where we had to do a race and run a lap around the around the playground, around the field. And so these were being timed and recorded. So I remember I ran my lap and after the class was over, I went to the PE coach um, and I asked him, I was like, uh, for all the laps that I had the fastest lap in school. And he was like, no, you don't, you're second. And I was like, okay, so who's in front of me? And his name was Blam DeLisi. And I remember like computing, it's like, okay, he's a year older, he's in second grade, I'm in first grade. Like, all right, I got some time. That's an age gap difference. I knew right then and there where I was planning and preparing to go. Mm. And in order to do that, it's like, I got to be the fastest kid in the school. There's one faster than me. He's a little bit older. I'm going to get him in time. So so early on, I knew where I was going. Well, after high school, didn't you play at the, the U.S. Army All-American Bowl? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, I did. And, and I'm not really familiar with this. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So how yeah. does this work? Are these all high school kids or these college oh, yeah, yeah. kids or? So this is all high school. It's kind of like, it's centered around the, um, the, the, the 
uh, high schools that are named like all Americans or the uh-huh. top 100 recruits. Oh, okay. So and all the best high school kids. All the best kind high the, school kind recruits. Like the McDonald's all American yeah, for basketball. Yeah, it, it is the exactly the okay, McDonald's all American game. I understand. Um, so the U.S. Army, uh, East and West, uh, the different parts of the country, and the the top 100, just the top recruits mm-hmm. all the way throughout. And I think uh, in Illinois, obviously, obviously number one, but throughout the, I think I was a number seven running back in the country and probably number like uh top 20 overall recruit i think i was number 11 um overall in the country okay so what did the college coaches start coming to your house to try to recruit you (laughs) how early Um, was that yeah yeah um uh let's see um there was so i committed um to so so my brother he played football as well and me and my brother were, were were close in age we kind of like went through the recruiting and all of that together. So uh, my brother was getting recruited, um, obviously a, a year before me, him being a year older. So uh, we kind of knew we wanted to go to school together. I committed to the college that I was going to go to before my junior season, after my sophomore year. Um, you could do that? I know, right? <laughs> Is that a thing? Um, I never heard I that know, before, right? Yeah. I committed really early yeah. because um, obviously me and my brother wanted to go to the same school. We were both being recruited. So I played the last two years of my high school, junior and senior year, when I had 1,800 yards, had 1,400 yards. And the whole time people knew I was an Illinois commit. Mm-hmm. So as I was being recruited still, there were colleges, USC, Miami, all the crazy places that I would just see letters on my um, high school coach's desk uh, uh, because, uh, they, you know, I just see the letters because I was already committed to Illinois and they were trying to find a way, you know, will he, will he decommit, will he break? But well, I knew you can decommit if you want, right? You can, but I, that's that's that. I knew that was home. That's where I was going. Um, so so the 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 recruiters were kind of held at a pause mm-hmm. because I already knew me and my brother were going to Illinois. Um, All right, and <laughs> and it's funny because before that, uh, man, I, and I gotta stay true to the to the story, man. I was I was I was being recruited before I got to high school. There were <laughs> there was the height when I was coming out of uh, little league, uh, elementary. There's. I got letters from certain high schools in the area. Now they're not supposed to be recruiting. Yes. <laughs> I don't believe, but there was um, high schools in the area that say, "Hey, family should move over here, go to this high school," because they wanted me to be a part of the football team. So they were trying to get me away from the Southwest um, mm-hmm. to play somewhere else, because in in, in Little League they kind of had an idea and knew who I was going to be. Well, why University of Illinois? Because I mean, granted, mm-hmm. Illinois is a uh, is no joke. Five national championships. Uh, 15 Big Ten championships. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could, you know, there's definitely an argument for bigger college, yeah. yes, you know, yes. football colleges out there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to be a part of the change. Mm-hmm. Uh, Illinois has some 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 tough years. Obviously, that's a, the, the state school and seeing like, seeing Illinois in the end zone, being a kid from Chicago, Illinois, it just spelled home for me. Uh, but, you know, the, the fighting the line, I had kind of been up and down, um, had some tough seasons, and I felt like with my talent, with my ability, I could help them turn around. Uh, so, so, so I really did that. I remember when I committed there, there were the other um, five or six top recruits in the state of Illinois. They were all committed to Iowa, the University of Iowa. Right. And I remember at one of those um, magazine shoots, um, they were speaking to me. They were like, "Yo, we're all going. You should come with us. <laughs> Let's go." To Iowa. I'm like, "Man, first of all, why y'all leaving the state, man? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like Illinois is is we from Ricky is from Illinois, um, but they were kind of like, "Yo, that 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 program's struggling right now. You sure you want to do that?" It was kind of seen as like not such a good move at that time. But what do you know? We went and and we had a tough time early on. Uh, started out two and nine my freshman year, um, two and ten my sophomore year. Then went uh had the big year went. Nine and three went to the Rose Bowl, finished nine and four. So um, I ended up being a part of that change. Well, yeah, I mean, your first year, like you said, you had two hundred eighteen yards, forty eight carries, uh, mm-hmm. eighty two yards receiving, two touchdowns. But overall, the team is struggling. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, mightily that year. <laughs> yeah, that second year, I mean, you tripled your rushing total. Mm-hmm. But once again. The team is struggling. I mean, yeah. were you thinking like, damn, I should have gone to Iowa or one of the other teams? Like, <laughs> no, right? Uh, no, not really. Cause I, I, man, I'm, I'm a pretty loyal cat, man. I was committed. And the thing is we were two and nine, two and 10, but the jump to that second year, uh, our, our, my, my college guys joke about this, uh, teammates, we had to be the best two and 10 team in the country. Like we, 
We were two <laughs> and nine. We were getting beat dead. But when we were two and ten, we were so close. We were in so many games. So we saw a like market improvement. We made such an improvement, even though those wins didn't come. So we felt like we were uh, we were in position. That, that the team was actually pretty good um, for for being two and ten in 06. And we felt like we were in position to make a to make a jump in. And we did. Like we 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 put the Big Ten on notice. We got um, we got our revenge on a lot of those teams that that walked over us the years before. All right, and you went all four years. Uh, three years. Three years. and then left went to the NFL. Okay, why not do the extra year? Get your degree. Uh huh. Is uh-huh. it a you know is it a fear of maybe being injured or something else like that? Uh, that's that's probably the most major thing when yeah. you're um uh, man when I was after the um I broke like every record you can break in one year for the college. So when you hot as fish grease, uh, there's, there's, there's no reason to stay. You know, the, the, the NFL's calling, I'm, I'm buzzing, like it's time to go and, and make the most of it right now. So I think uh, staying, you risk so much more, especially playing running back. Yeah. That's a year off your body, year off your life in a sense. Uh, why not take that to the NFL? Uh, so yeah, so it just, it felt right. felt like the time to move. Okay, then in 2008, mm-hmm. you went to the draft. Yes. Well, ESPN ranked you the 30th best running back in the league. Yes, coming in. Coming, coming in. in. Yes. Which is a big deal. Oh, yeah, for, for not stepping on the field. Yeah, most <laughs> you haven't played a single pro game, and they're already saying you're number 30. Yeah, absolutely. Out of all the pros out there. Absolutely. Coming into the draft, how'd you feel? Man, um, well, one, probably tired, because you go through your college season, you go through the training. Uh, I was still in school. I was one of the... Um, well, one of the few guys that, that that made the decision to stay in school while I was going through the draft process. And as I was doing that, I was getting so overwhelmed. I was like, yo, this is not really going to work out. My my agent told me I kind of need to 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 drop out of school and, and get just straight training. Mm. Um so I was I was kind of working a lot going into the going into the combine, going into the draft, and I was kind of like, okay, we got one more showing uh, of skills and traits and sets, and then um you can take that breath. Um, so, so going into it, I was excited, but I knew, um, I knew there was a lot on the table. This is, um, you know, for, for an athlete, this is your biggest, um, interview, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. job interview for, for, for the entire NFL. Um, so, so, so through all the, through all the work and, and everything I had going on, I knew, um, we got to make one more showing at the combine. So I was just, uh, just kind of locked in on, on, on putting my talents and abilities on display one last time. Was there a team that you wanted to play for? Because it's not really up to you. No, it's I mean, not. I mean, kind of. I mean, depending on who you are, you can kind of finagle things. No. But in general, yeah, you get picked by whoever picks you, and then that's absolutely, where you go. absolutely. No, it's not up to you at all. Yeah. Um, so I just, uh, I just wanted to be in the right place. Um, I left that up to God, and, and you know, I knew I, I would end up where I was meant to and supposed to, hopefully. So that's all I was thinking about. There was um, a little bit of um, talk or chatter about me staying home, staying mm-hmm. like with the Chicago Bears. Yeah. And I like obviously the teams, you know, in my heart and everything, but being that close to home, I didn't know how that would like how that would pan out, play out. So I just kind of, you know, left left everything open and uh, let the wind take me where I was going. Well, on the day of the draft, mm-hmm. first round, 23rd overall pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yes. Yes. How did you feel when you heard that? Um, the first thing you probably feel is relieved when they call your name. Because it's like, okay, you know it's real. It's it's official. But 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 right after that I was I was stoked, really. I was um um uh, just uh kind of like that that franchise and the just the the reverence, the respect um uh, on, on on that organization and their name. I was um ecstatic to be a part of and just like uh was really, really ready to go. Uh, ready to go to work, ready to to, to put my medal on display. Well, you got a five-year contract worth twelve point five five million with the mm-hmm. Steelers. Yes, with seven point one two five million guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, coming from a, a kid from Southside, that's a lot of money, but it's Absolutely. not a huge amount of money for the NFL. Oh, uh, yeah, but I I kept it in context. Kid from the Southside, that that was a lot of money. This was this was from the time I was seven. Um, it's funny that's something my mom. Um, this this will bring it back something my mom said to me um in the last few years where like a, a point in time with you know family work responsibility having an estate I kind of said to my mom and even the transition out of football I said to her I was like tired and she was like uh, of course you are you've been going since you were seven yeah 
And when she said that, I'm not gonna lie, when she said that, I broke down. I'm like, damn, how did you know that? Like I've been going since I was seven years yes. old because I um, kind of had the idea at a young age when I asked my uh, PE teacher who was the fastest. I knew that like uh, my mother and father are not together. So, uh, you know, with it being me and my brother, I knew the situation we were in, um, with my family, if that was gonna change, it was kind of really gonna be up to me. You know what I'm saying? I knew my brother was gonna do his best and lead the way and help out, but I kind of always had this feeling it would come down to me. So when I got drafted, um, 12 and a half million, this is what I worked for through my life, for our family, this changes our family forever. So I, I kind of took that, I wasn't chasing the 30 million, 100 million, all of this and that. I took that and I'm like, this is enough to to change my family's trajectory forever. And it, and it did, and it still has. Um, so that was, that was everything in the world to me. Right. And the reason I'm not downplaying the amount, I'm just saying oh, no, that no, I know. five years, 12 and a half million, that's like two and change per year. But yeah, then, yeah. you know, uh, the management takes a cut. Yeah. yeah. And then Uncle Sam. Taxes. <laughs> you're, you're, you at, you're at the highest yeah, tax, you know, right. yeah. tax level. So so they're yeah. taking another 40 percent. Oh, for sure they are. You know, you know what I'm saying? So once the dust settles, you know, uh -huh. you got a big family. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. you buy your mom a house? Uh, yes, I did. Buy your um, mama house and then yep. your siblings. Yep. Sure, they got a little something. Uh, what I'm yeah, saying yeah. is, after the dust Vehicles. settles, it's not. A, yeah. you're not looking at ten yeah, million yeah. in the bank anymore. Oh, for sure. But yeah. our homes, even even my first uh, place, the place I bought in Pittsburgh, is 290k. Oh, okay, so um, you're my mom's relatively home, inexpensive. Yeah, yeah, my mom's home was probably like 260k. Oh, okay, so you didn't go all out and just. Nah, man. I mean, it was this was better than the apartment we were staying in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We yeah. we had everything. We had enough. So I I I, I, I kind of figured if whatever I made. Uh, I set my standard of living as small as possible, as small as I could, so we'd have it for the long haul. Um, I'm thinking about like uh, my shorties, my kids now, and like them having what they need off based off that same contract, based off of the the first time out. That's smart. It's something you don't see very often. Oh yeah, there you know, there's that like competition in the locker room. Exactly. Like, who's doing what? And who's got this? Right. Bump that man. I was I was hungry before. Uh, okay. Like, I, yeah, so your I'm, first car was what? Uh, it was a Jaguar. Um, and okay, it was funny. So they you, made fun of it. No, kind of nice for the car. So it was uh, 2003. So I got drafted in 08. I bought a, oh, a five-year-old Jaguar. 2003. Okay, all right. XJR I, I see where you're going with this. For a 23K. Um, uh, okay. 23K Jaguar. And first round pick, I'm pulling up to the lot. And there's the, you know, there's the Hummers. There's Rolls the Ranges. Races, yeah. Benzes, all of that. And so it is like, you know, first round pick. Was he, How's he coming? You know, the kid from Illinois, they heard about me. You know, I had the muscles popping out the jersey and everything. So it was like, you know, and so it was like, oh man, you got the old Jaguar? What are you like? You know, we on dad time? Like, what's up? <laughs> so they made fun of it, but I, I still whipped that thing until uh until up until last year, 2023. So I was still you driving. You still had that same car. Yes, until I drove last I drove year. that to ballers every single day. Wow. My 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 Jaguar, XJR. Uh same vehicle to Arizona my last year, uh to work every day, to to HBO, to um to our company now. All the, all the way until right now. I'm impressed, man. Because I know when I first started making money, I fucked it off. <laughs> Is that <laughs> I, right? I definitely messed that um, money up, went into debt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I've seen it over and over again. Yeah, You know, with yeah, lots yeah. of people I interviewed. Yeah. You know, hey, I was, you know, like, like Joe Smith. Uh -huh. He had made like 40 million. And then yeah. at one point, yeah. he was 30,000 in debt. Wow. You know, so, wow. so you yeah, see yeah, these yeah. kind of stories. Yeah, most of all most, the time. So, so congrats it, on having a good head on your shoulder, having a good mom that. to really oh, no, help course. navigate that, which is what it sounds like. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what do you think that is though? Cause I for me, oh yeah, my mom helped a lot, but I'm like, for for um and you saying like growing up in the projects and people for for cats. I was in the projects for a short period of time. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't grow up in the I, projects. I, got you, I, I got don't you. want to misrepresent <laughs> my myself. My bad, my bad. Come on, yeah, we, we yeah, were yeah. immigrants and we first moved to America. We were okay, in the projects. Got you. I don't want to say I grew up in the projects. I got I you. Yeah. So I'm saying, uh, coming from humble beginnings, anybody and seeing that much, like I couldn't, man, I couldn't understand ever being in a position where you could lose that. I, I was holding on for dear life because I yeah. didn't want to be back there. You know what I'm saying? I, I think for me, when it starts to come, you think it'll just keep coming at that level forever. I got you. That yeah, was yeah. my big mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I, I wasn't you. doing sports, but I had a successful business, and I'm like, yeah. okay, it's a yeah, tech yeah. business, and the internet's growing. Oh, you know what? Yeah, this will this will never stop. And then the dot com crash happens, yeah, and then yeah, it all yeah. stops. I you know what I'm you. saying? So <laughs> it, it's like that was my big mistake. Most well, definitely. Well, you know, stuff. now after going completely broke and yeah, having yeah. to sleep on couches and being semi yeah. homeless, yeah, yeah, now yeah. I always think I could go back to that. So okay. let me be as conservative as possible. Yeah, 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 let me sure. underspend. For sure. But 
back then being a 20 something year old. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. thinking. I got smart, you. I got you. But you were. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, being a running back, NFL run, you, it's dangerous. Yeah. I'm, I'm one hit away. That's kind of how I saw it. True. One hit away. And then, you know, the, the phone stops ringing. So uh, I, I think that's probably part of it. Okay. So now you're playing with the Steelers. Mm -hmm. Your third preseason game against Minnesota. Yes. You fumbled twice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Was it the adjustment from going from college to pros? Or what was um, it? That's the, that's the trial and error error that like you need when you... So uh, I, I spoke a little bit about this uh, on the Raw Room, but there was... Um, so third preseason game. My, my first preseason didn't fumble. Uh, preseason game because that would be crazy. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. First round pick, all eyes on you. Second game uh, against the Bills, didn't fumble at all, being being secure. In the third preseason game, I remember going into that game and I looked left, looked right, and I'm like, okay, I have to really find out what I can do in the NFL and what I can't do. I have to really explore that. So that was kind of like me pushing the limits, me pushing what I'm able to do, the both fumbles happened on the left side of the field. I have the ball in my left hand. Uh, and, you know, I, I had an injury that's affected my left hand, so I knew that was going to be um, uh, a, a kind of tougher thing to me, for me to do. So I had to find out if I could hold the ball in my left in the NFL, find out what kind of open field moves I can use. That was kind of me before we get into the season, having to learn what type of running back I would be, what type of player I'd be, and what type of, like, skill set I could use. Um, so that's if there's a time to do it it was then um mm -hmm. so that's kind of how i approached that game and how i approached the last two games i got to find out what i can do who i'm going to be so that was kind of like that trial and error and those those were the error well after that game your teammate heinz ward yes <laughs> <laughs> tell me what he did oh yeah uh he did the uh the 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 program that the, the movie uh in college where they put a ball in my hand uh in the facility and said all right keep this ball uh, everybody in here is going to try to make you lose it and fumble. And for every uh, time you lose a ball, you owe us a hundred dollars. Um, right. Uh, uh, five hundred for <laughs> for um, if it's a um, well, there, there were five hundred dollar balls as well. So he put a ball in my hand and, and and just wanted to let me know the importance of, you know, you you're going to be our running back. You're carrying our hopes and dreams in your arms. So like, um, you know, they wanted to let me know how serious it was. So you'd have to carry that ball everywhere you went. Everywhere, breakfast, lunch, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> off the, but I'm by my locker. It just, it didn't matter. The only time off was going into the shower, really, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it, it was serious. Um, and how often would the teammates try to like grab the ball from you? Oh, no, they, they did. If, if you, <laughs> they want to like catch you fall, like falling asleep, find you falling asleep with it. Like, cause, um, but, but that's a tough thing to do to really be like secure with that for, for 24 hours or for the whole time we're at the facility. Uh, that was a tough thing, but it, just kind of like to, to drill in your mind how important it is. Well, you had one more fumble in a, yes. the final preseason game. Final preseason game, yeah. But after that, you know, you you and Coach Kirby Wilson actually worked on that. To oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Problem. We were good uh, going into the year. That, that last one was uh, left side of the field once again. Uh, I made an outside-in move. Uh, defender was coming inside out, spun back inside, uh, got closed on by a DM. So it was kind of like, yep, that's a risky move. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I feel like I learned a lot um, through, through the trial, through that testing, uh, through those errors. We went into the year, and I kind of had a, a, a greater plan of how I was going to approach the defense, how I was going to attack the defense, yep. and when it's time to get north and south, and when you have enough time, when you have enough space to, to make a move. Uh, I, I kind of found the, in that adjustment, found the difference from college because college, you have enough time to make that 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 left hand inside spin, and then that guy that's coming, he's still going to get it too. But this guy's in the NFL; he's closing faster than I've ever experienced. So, <laughs> so going into the season, I kind of knew I, I was adjusted to what the speed of the game was and what we needed. And so my rookie year didn't fumble anymore at all. Well, yeah, I mean the pros are a lot more vicious. There's absolutely hundreds of millions of dollars on oh, the yeah, line. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. They don't. And yeah. <laughs> they don't care about your feelings. <laughs> no, like, no, no, they don't care about. They don't care about your body. Their job, so yeah, yeah, they yeah. have a chance to tear that ball out your hand. Oh, for sure, and that by that, any means necessary. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that was like the uh, we called it like Killer Man growing up, like the Killer Man NFL. Where they they really trying to get at you, and this is the the top of the top of the top, even of college, and the best of the best. So, um, yeah, yeah, it took some time to to learn what that game was. 
Well, coming to the regular season that year, you're the youngest player mm -hmm. on the team. Yes, yes. I was uh, 20 when I got drafted. So I was um, 21 going into uh, going going into the the year. Yeah, youngest player on the team, maybe uh, maybe one of the youngest in the NFL at that time. Okay, right. Because yeah, mm -hmm. you, I mean, unlike the NBA, you don't see people coming out of high school into the NFL. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Does that ever happen at all? Or? No, you can't. You have to be um, three years removed from three high years. school. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Okay. So I I was kind of um, I was young from my age in high school. Right. Uh, then went to college, left early, obviously after three years. So I was in the NFL as soon as you possibly could be uh, three years removed. So 20, 21 years old. Okay. So now you're playing the regular season mm -hmm. and you end up having a bad injury. Oh, yes. Uh, fractured scapula, week four, start against the Ravens. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, like you said before, in this game, you're one injury away to just being yes. completely out. Yes, yes. Was this your wor the worst injury you ever had up to this point? That's the first injury I ever had. I mean, if you point. count college and everything else. Yeah, like yeah. That. No, that's the that's the first injury I had that required me to miss a game. Period. Uh, yeah, so that's the first injury I okay. ever had. Yes. So now you're realizing how serious this career is. Yes, um, of course. Um, but man, I think the... Uh, the the way it went was dope though. <laughs> the way because it's a fractured scapula, and um, we're playing our our division rival, the Baltimore Ravens. Right. You know, I signed a five year contract. We're going to see them twice a year. This is the game where I have to make my introduction to to the Ravens and where they're going to learn me. So um, everybody's got their battles. The 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 defensive ends are trying to get to the quarterback. Receivers are going against cornerbacks and, and DBs. So as a running back, your your arch nemesis is the middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm 21 years old, person that got across from me is one of the greatest to ever play the game, Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis. <laughs> Ray Lewis. So um, so in this game, I'm knowing this isn't just about this game. This is about my career and be making a name for myself and a staple um, while I'm here. So in that game, I'm you know, kind of playing uh, peekaboo <laughs> with Ray. Um, I'm in one gap. I'm in another. I'm just saying, uh, miss me jumping, you know, jumping in the holes in the gaps. And, uh, and, you know, he said something to me during that game. It's like, all right, you know, we trying to get you, we coming for you, um, a type thing. And this was a play where, you know, I did enough, like, um, scatting. I did enough, like, uh, 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 uh like, like quick moves. I seen him in a hole and this was the time to like, to, to make my intro, to lay the hammer. So that one opportunity came where there was no way around it. And I had to meet him in his hole. So I ran at Ray Lewis with every single thing that I had just to introduce myself. So right. in reality, in my mind, I'm like, that may be the hardest he's ever been hit by a smaller man. <laughs> in my mind, it's like, if you, if you seen a, a, a fly, whatever the case, that thing flew straight at you right between your eyes. And you're like, damn, that it went out, but that was a bad motherfucker. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? That was kind of my approach to where it's like, I went out with everything so he would know who I am. It cost me my shoulder but I made my introduction. So that was the payoff. And, and you know, I, I had a solid outing that first game and then I was out for the rest of the year, but I, but I made my intro. Right, so you're out the rest of the season. Rest of the season. Your rookie year. Yep, yep. That must've hurt. It did, um, it did, it definitely did. Um, it, 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 uh, it was tough, I, I felt like, I just wish I, I like could have done more for my teammates. I, I wanted to be out there with them so they would know who I, who I am. Uh, but that's something you you can't control. And that's a button that I would press again. You'd have to press every time. There's Ray. I got to let him know who I am. That's where I first learned that that's a shoulder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I the, the way I went out, like I, I couldn't have drawn it up any better. But not being there did hurt me uh, for my teammates and obviously for the city, for the fans. Uh, but I carried it where, you know, next year they're going to have to feel I'll be back next year. Well, you were on the Best Damn Sports Show, period, mm -hmm. on the segment called The Best Damn Rookie Hazing. <laughs> yes, yes. How badly were you hazed as a rookie? Um, they So my my running back room, uh, I, I got it a little bit. Um, well, well, I got it a, a, a good amount um, between the carrying the football and um, having to bring in like like uh, Popeyes uh, for away games, uh, mm -hmm. having to get donuts for the team. Um, different things like that. But my my running back room, Willie Parker and Kerry Davis, the leaders of the room, they were um they 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 were pretty cool about it. They didn't they didn't make things too crazy, um, carrying pads, things like that. So 
Um, so, so, so I got it a little bit, but it, it wasn't crazy. Okay. Well, that next year you mentioned Willie Parker, he mm-hmm. actually got injured and now yes. you get to start. Yes. Yes. How did that feel? Um, so that was, uh, year two, uh, he got injured, uh, in the week three game against Cincinnati, uh, Bengals, uh, a game I didn't, a game I didn't play in where I was sat, uh, for, for practice reasons. That was a, a notable thing. And then it kind of tripped me out when he wasn't going to be there. I had just like sat the week before and I, I thought the coaches like didn't like me <laughs> or something where I thought I was like done though. And they were like, okay, you're starting, um, this week. And it was a kind of crazy turn because they were like, you're starting. And they just had full confidence in me. You know what I'm saying? From the, And I'm like, maybe they had to. <laughs> but like, they'd like, no, you're ready. And I'm like, man, I thought just because of the way they, you know, they're coaching you really hard. I thought, I'm like, damn, I thought I was like some uh, ways away from being ready. And they're like, no, you're ready. And they just, I'm, I'm sitting in the chair now. And we just picked up from right there and uh, went out to, to have uh, statistically my best game in the NFL. Right, uh, against the, the San Diego Chargers. Yes, yes. Yep, 165 yards, two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And overall, you had a solid year. 1,100 yards, seven touchdowns. Absolutely. You know, now you're kind of getting into your own in the Absolutely. NFL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next year, 2010, uh, Antonio Brown joins the team. Yes, he does. Mm-hmm. What was your initial thoughts of Antonio? Uh, man, that's a great question. Uh, we... You know, it, 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 his his uh, his story is unique. Obviously, he shares it with Tom being drafted in the sixth round. So him being so far in the draft, he's one of those guys that you don't naturally pay attention to. You think he's a guy that could be here today, gone tomorrow, right? But from the time he got in there, he 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 stood out. Like um, we're in practice every day, and he's 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 torching our number one corners like our, our top guys and we're like is this practice or, or is this for real like <laughs> you know you just you you don't naturally pay attention to a six rounder but you noticed him like when he's walking around his his focus like his gaze is there when somebody's speaking it's, it's kind of like oh uh, i was gonna say like how oh, you are now like when somebody's speaking he's really listening you can feel him taking that in um and for a young guy that's a like distinguishable like noticeable trait like he pays attention he he you you would always find him soaking in wisdom you'd find him around Heinz Ward um I, I I'd see him around me I, I'm not gonna lie that's why I knew he's a pretty smart dude when I looked up one day he was like one step to my right <laughs> like one step behind me paying attention well I was like okay like you a smart guy you 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 finding th- th- those guys he was trying to learn from the uh from the onset from the beginning so he's a um early thoughts he was very intelligent like a sponge um uh, very focused very driven and when he went out to play, he played like that. So he was somebody we took notice of and somebody that I kept watching. And uh, and obviously, I don't know if you know, like me and him formed a very close relationship. Okay, from, um, that from we the still very have. beginning? From basically from okay. from really, really early on. Yeah. Really early on. I think uh, from the position I was in, being the starter, you kind of have to, you kind of have to ignore guys like that or keep them at a distance because you don't know what's going to happen. But like he, he, he kind of, he kind of got in like pretty, pretty close. Uh, uh, pretty early on. Well, you had a solid year that year. Uh, mm-hmm. 1,300 yards, 13 touchdowns. Man, I'd, I'd say it was better than solid. Well, because really it leads up to uh-huh. the Super Bowl. Yes. How did it feel to go to the Super Bowl? This is, what, your third year? Third year. Yeah. Um, man, I was on a mission. Uh, I was on a mission from my rookie year when we went to the Super Bowl and I felt the confetti rain and I wasn't able to suit up. I couldn't wait my second year to put a uniform on and bring us to that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my third year, I'm on a mission. Uh, something my mom said, obviously, my mom very believing in God. She wrote a notebook uh, going into my career. Uh, she she wrote in a notebook that we would be going to the Super Bowl two times in the, in my first in the first three years. And somehow, some ways, <laughs> this dad really happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me in that third year, uh, I, that's, that's all I worked towards. That's all I thought about in the all season. That's all I prepared for. So for me going into the Super Bowl that third year, there was, there was no doubt in my mind. There was no, there wasn't no room for anything else because I felt like, man, I owe, I felt like I owe this city a championship. I owe myself. I owe my, my high school coaches. Like that's, that's what you play this game for. 
if you feel like you're that good, if you feel like you're great, that's what you do it for. So for me, I don't feel like I just went. I played the role to carry my team to go to that game. So when we got there, I'm like, there's only one thing to do now. One job. Let's get it. Right. And you guys are playing mm-hmm. the Green Bay Packers. Yes. How Absolutely. fearsome of a team were they? Man, I can, we're the Steelers. So we, I'm not seeing no team better than us. Okay. So you're not like, at all. We're, not at all. We're, we're, we're the yeah. Steelers. Let's go. If we play our game, we can do this. And we know that's a formidable opponent, but I'm like, yeah. it's, it's about us and what we do. Well, in the fourth quarter, mm-hmm. there was the fumble. Yes. And, you know, the fumbles happen early on, but you don't really hear about them happening mm-hmm. up until this very important game. Yes. So when that happened, how'd you feel? Man, strong. Strong. When that happened, it's the first play of the fourth quarter. We still have a whole game to play. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to come out here and kill them. It's not over. So the the play that's called, so the the full feeling, it's like it's kind of like um in that game, we had um we were kind of uh we had some success in the run. We were having pretty good success in the run throughout that game. Uh, we were a little bit pass heavy. It was kind of feeling like, you know, uh, a quarterback, Ben, and the receivers, they were they were really close to finding each other. We hadn't gotten there yet, but we wanted to keep giving him opportunities, keep giving them opportunities to find each other. Um, so, but when we we had a drive that was all on the ground, 50 yards, uh, and, I, and I put the final uh, touchdown on the board, uh, the eight-yard run. Uh, so when we got to this point, we're down by four. Uh, we got to drive. Okay, we know what we want to do. We want to put it on the ground. So when I heard the call, it was 34 apart. And I remember hearing that, and it was kind of like um, in the movies, like when, uh, when, when, when they got that one more job to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like, ah, is this? It's just, when I heard it, I was like, ah, man, we, we had run part that I, I felt him. He was trying to, like, our, our OC, Rie, he was trying to kill him. Let's do him right now. I heard that call. I'm like, man, we've run 34 part a bit this game, but fuck it. Let's do it. Let's go. This is our bread and butter. Let's make this work. Um, so I get in my stance to line up, and in my mind, there's only one thing. Every play in my mind is a touchdown until proven otherwise. Uh, so, okay, got to make this go. We're going to make this work. The next thing I know, after the handoff, ball's in the air. And that was like one of the lowest feelings. Um, I'm like, I'm being held and I'm going down. And I know that. And I see the ball there. And I'm just hoping, I'm fight to the end. I'm just hoping, please, DJ, turn around, (laughs) see that ball, get it, so we can keep on offense. They got the ball, they recover. I know I lost that ball. When I stood up, you got two choices. And that's why I said strong. I felt like in the stadium, it felt like the whole stadium. When I'm running off the field, it felt like the entire stadium and even stadiums beyond that. I'm like, why is there so many stadiums? Because it's the Super Bowl. Everybody's watching. Mm -hmm. And you can feel that. You can feel that energy. For all the stadiums watching, I'm running off the field. The defense is running on the field. And the entire arena could easily feel like, damn, we, what just happened was really bad. And it's my fault. I run off the field. And there's one person waiting on me. It's our running back coach, Kirby Wilson. I get to him and the entire runoff kept my head up, kept my, kept my steed up, kept myself ready to go because I know one thing and it's the same thing he asked me. He says, Rashard, was there anything you could have done on that play? I said, no coach. I couldn't. It's nothing I could have done. He said, yes, I know. Slap me on the head, slap me on the ass. I went back to the bench and I'm just ready to get another opportunity to kill them. Because for the way that play went down, we lose a shade. We, we don't touch the end on the edge. Like that's the worst circumstance that could happen. And then the worst thing that can happen is me lose the ball, me be separated from the ball, dead. But I remained strong. I kept my head up in that moment because we still got a game to play. We still got a game to win. And that hasn't changed my desire, my fuel, my fire to go out there and play and win to this day. And I still feel like that to this day. Yeah. Well, you guys lose 31 to 25. I, I didn't let that moment like take me down and bring yeah. me down. You guys lose 31 to 25. Close yes. game. Yes. yes One yes, touchdown yes. would have yeah. put it the other way. 
Absolutely. You know, with the extra point, of course. Yeah. We still got to get that touchdown. That yeah. play could have been that touchdown. Yeah. That's how you call that play. I'm about to break through here and score. Right. Something else happens. So every play, it's just like that in the NFL. And it's very much a team sport. Absolutely. There are so many players, so many moving parts. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's one mistake out of mm -hmm. a lot of potential outcomes. Yeah. But, you know, this becomes one of those things where, and we all have it as public figures. Yeah, if someone yeah, gets yeah. mad at you, they'll pull out that one thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely, this is that absolutely. one thing they always pull out at you absolutely. where, oh, okay, you know, the Steelers didn't get another Super Bowl because of you. Yes. And to this day, I still see it. Oh, yeah. You know what there. I mean? And it's I know there. it's annoying because I have it's there. little things with me that's also annoying that I know that in any yeah. type of argument, let yeah. me pull that out of Vlad. So this Most is what have. they pull out on you. Most F. Even Most in have. 2024. Most F. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you have to go through it. But ultimately, we all decide to be public figures in our own way. Yes. And it's not always, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. all good yeah, all yeah. the way. There's always going to be some downsides. And this is just because part of, of our history. This is part of your history. Absolutely. Uh, that's something uh, my uh, my partner, uh, friend said, Stephen Levinson, uh, the, the last time I visited with him, he said, isn't that the price or the cost of being a professional athlete? Mm -hmm. um, you don't always you don't write or control that narrative right and and so you can you can be a part of it or subject to it um and i thought that was very poignant what he said but to something you said and this is the which would be seen as torment but it's not torment for me something you said uh which is implied is like a mistake a mistake would imply that you messed up and there was something you could have done. When it comes to that play, I'm like, what could I have done? I'm still sitting here today. What could I have done? I get a handoff. I'm closing the backfield after the handoff. In my mind, in my body, in my psyche, that's not a mistake. That's just the result of the play. The fumble is a result of that play. And the word fumble like implies blunder. But I'm like, I didn't make a blunder. There's nothing that can be done. So I'm I live my life and I'm like, I'm not carrying a mistake that I made because if I did, then there's something I could have done better. I couldn't have held the ball any better. I got the handoff like I always do. I couldn't have made another decision. This play is closed. So it goes down as a mistake for a moment, a move that was never a stake for me. It was just a result. And so to that, it's like this, how do you wear or carry like, there's nothing that could have been done. If I could go back, there's nothing that could have been done. And so, uh, I don't know. It's like, is that something you fight for? For me, yeah. And it's just like, is that a hill that I'm willing to die on? Hell yeah. Because I'm going to have to live on it anyway. Hey, man, listen. At the end of the day, 99.9% .9 of people who talk trash about you have never gotten even gone to a Super Bowl, oh, much less been part of multiple Super Bowls. I know. So yeah. it just is what it is. We all yeah. have this as public figures, yeah. and yeah. this is what we signed up for. So we yes. can't cry about it yes. when people pull this up. Yes. It is what it is. You're right. In football, in my football life, there's not a single moment from recess, from the playground, to Little League, to high school, to college, where I've ever felt like I let my team down. Mm -hmm. And through the NFL and in that Super Bowl and that play, I feel the same way. I've never allowed myself to believe that I let my team down. I was ready to go and I'm still ready to go. Did any of your teammates give you a hard time over that? No, not at all. Not a single one? Not a single one. That's what's no, up. not a single one. That's what's not up. a single one. Love they it. know who I am. They yeah. know how I bleed for this game and this sport and that team. Um, now things have been said in like, you know, the public circuits or the media, different things, mm -hmm. even like um, James Harrison, uh, uh, long time defensive end, uh, probably Hall of Famer, like all time great. He said, and uh, I don't know if you remember the sports cover, he was on cover of ESPN magazine. He had two guns <laughs> like this shirt off <laughs> um, and he called me a fumble machine. Uh, mm. And that was, and that was something I addressed right away. I put the stats up. I had uh, 324 carries that year, only two fumbles. Um, and, and so that was something I addressed at the time, but th things were said, but there was, there was never a hard time given to me 
in the in the realm of football, in the realm of TV and entertainment. That's a, that's a different story. Okay, so that next year, a mm-hmm. little bit of a tough year for you. Two thousand eleven. Uh, not not necessarily. It, it kind of goes down as that stat wise, but we were just kind of um, it we were kind of like a, a little more pass focus that year. So the the running game wasn't featured as much as it was the, the previous two years. Right, you only had a hundred yards. Uh, well, you rushed over hundred yards twice. two times in fifteen games. Yes. Uh, nine touchdowns, four yards per carry. Uh, nine nine hundred twenty eight yards and nine touchdowns in the NFL. That's all. That's doing something still. Yeah. But it's not the same. As the year uh, before. Le- as the year before, the right. year before that. Yes. Well, uh, that same year, uh, Osama bin Laden mm-hmm. uh, was assassinated by the U.S. Yes. And you made some comments. Yes. Uh, a tweet. What, what were those comments? Uh, I believe the tweet was, um, what kind of person celebrates death? Uh, it's amazing how we can hate a man it's amazing how somebody can hate a man we've never even heard they've never even heard speak we've only heard one side i believe that's a tweet okay was there something about a conspiracy theory uh not so much so it's funny i said this in the writer's room where there was a um uh a friend of mine uh basketball player in illinois uh who tweeted me it's like uh he was like uh besides uh i'm trying to think of what he said um uh, as far as when it came to 9-11, saying we, you know, we don't have any evidence of what happened other than the government telling us. And I said, this is what I said, that that goes on conspiracy theory. Uh, we'll never know what really happened. I just have a hard time believing a plane could take a skyscraper down demolition style. So that went in the books as like conspiracy theory. But at that time, and it's funny, I said this to the writer's room, it's just like, I had no... um study or history of conspiracy mm-hmm. i'm just like black and skeptical <laughs> you see what i'm saying i'm like <laughs> i don't know if that shit went down like that i wasn't right. there <laughs> you know what i'm saying well i mean those um, those buildings are designed to collapse a certain type of way otherwise they would fall over and destroy everybody in the process so oh of course there, there is of course there is structurally certain things yeah, so yeah. when you talk to architects they say yes it's supposed to collapse that way and collapse and demolition yeah is that correct correct um and and that's all saying like collapse uh, yeah. So, so I, I don't know. I just, um, yeah, I, I, I just remember, um, as, as a black person, um, in this country and seeing, uh, kind of where I grew up in history and having a knowledge of the middle passage in Africa, seeing so many, um, times or stakes in history where we're being told a thing or being lied to. I just kind of, um, was like, man, I, um, I, I, I'd want to know more. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't take it at face value. Right. You were, you were Kyrie before Kyrie. In a kind way. of. No, kind but of. like, yeah. for real? Yeah. At that time That's in NFL, I was, yeah, Kyrie. Like, for real. Yeah. <laughs> he's Mendenhall. I mean, he's Mendenhall after Mendenhall. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> and, and yeah, and it's just like uh, <laughs> like a, a, a curious mind and like, dog, man, I, um, I've been told shit before and that's not enough to make me jump. That's that's it. That's That's how I am. Regardless, man, I'm black in this country and I'm skeptical. <laughs> like, for real. Well, you know what I think it is? Like, for example, I grew up on the West Coast mm-hmm. in the Bay Area. And, oh, and I want you to keep that. And that's no disrespect to that moment, how devastating it was. Yeah. Like, people that lost their lives, people that had to volunteer running those buildings. The devastation right. is everything that it is. And that's terrible and that's horrible. Now, how that went down, if like, if you're on the block and these two fought, what they fighting over? Man, they fighting over her. Man, I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it's about that. Like, what, yeah. what did we do to those people why is this going down i really want to know what happened well here's the thing right this is what i realized yeah in my own life because i was living in the bay area when mm-hmm. 9-11 happened yeah and i remember when the buildings went down and my neighbor was going crazy and screaming mm-hmm. all types of yeah. racist shit and yeah, you know yeah. about arabs yeah it, was, yeah it was a mess but then you go outside and it's just another day in oakland right but then right around that time i was starting to travel to new york more and I remember going to New York a few months after 9-11 and New Yorkers were devastated. For sure. Were For sure. really upset. I remember For driving sure. around and my man was like, yo, I miss my buildings. You know, I used to use yeah. them to kind of navigate yeah. as I'm going around the city yeah. and now they're yeah. just gone. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. with that, thousands of people are dead. And for sure. Firefighters are messed up. And for sure. first responders are messed sure. up and everything sure. else like that. So I think for sure. living in Pittsburgh, you don't quite get what's happening in New York. So that's yeah, just yeah. natural as a yeah. human being. Yeah. For but sure. like the devastation, I mean, it was the worst terrorist attack Absolutely. in US We've history. Ever seen. We've ever period. Seen. Absolutely. And it's probably going to be like that for the foreseeable future. No, so for sure. when you throw out statements like that, you know, I'm sure lots of people were happy that Bin Laden was dead. You for know, sure. Clearly, for Obama sure. was happy that Bin oh, Laden sure. was dead. No, that was part of his him. legacy. Absolutely. So Absolutely. questioning that, I could see yeah, why yeah, people yeah. would get upset. Oh, no. I, I understand. And and no lie, I'm happy Bin Laden's dead. And I was happy Bin Laden's mm. dead. I'm there like, in the, in the... I remember in 9-11 and how there were other countries celebrating mm -hmm. that we had just been hit. And that shit seemed so evil and barbaric. Yeah. I couldn't imagine that we'd become that same thing where it's just like, kind of like when Obama came up and he said, all right, we did the job. Yeah. America's a safer place. Let's go to bed. That's kind of, I took it. Okay, cool. He's off. We don't yeah. have that same threat. And he even said, we're not going to spike the ball. We're not going to yeah. show the body. That's it. Yeah. We're not going to. Okay. So I kind of thought we would take that same approach to where it's like, boom, we're glad that's done. We hope the, the, the lives are paid their respect. Let's move on. That celebration, seeing the same level of our, our barbaric, as the other and it just kind of it kind of like taunting see it's just like damn are they coming back for us <laughs> do, do you know what i'm saying what we give it so so um yeah yeah that's that's I, i'm glad he's dead i'm glad he's gone uh i i, I just uh I, at that time i was like uh i was kind of moral nut at that time too <laughs> i was like a little bit moral nut i'm like damn why we spike the ball why we do that we yeah. could have took this with reverence and respect I, I i played my life and my career like that um growing up in the church uh having a mother who um the, that standard in our home was excellence. Like there's a there's a way you do things. Certain things go about it. I remember I was a kid, and I asked my my college coach when I scored. A, I mean, uh, my my little league coach when I scored a touchdown, could I dance and celebrate? He was like, No, you don't do that. So that was kind of something that was that was built into me. So that was my reaction as a young man when I saw it. Yeah, I mean, your story almost reminds me of uh, Evander Holyfield mm. when I interviewed him. Mm. His mom was very religious. Yes, and stuff like that, and. I remember he would tell me, like, for example, when he won the bronze in the Olympics. Yeah. And it was kind of a, a bad referee call that made yeah. him potentially lose the call. Yeah. yeah. But when he thought about acting out, his mom was there and he knew that his mom would get into the ring and smack him <laughs> in front of the whole <laughs> no, world. No, like, for real. <laughs> for real. Because she always for expressed real. to him, like, you're for not real. the only one going through this. Yes. You know, you're not going to sit yes. here and act a fool and, and embarrass yes. us and everything else like yes. that. Yes. Everyone yes. goes through their yes. hard times. So when yes. you lose, yeah. you take your losses. Yeah. 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 And when yeah. you yeah. win, you don't overly yeah. celebrate. Yeah. And to Absolutely. this day, this is exactly how he is. No, that you know, makes even sense. through the ear bitings, and yeah, all the yeah, crazy yeah, stuff yeah. he went through, losing. Yeah, and his he home. said he still had love for that man throughout. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Kind of, you know, I, yeah, I'm kind of seeing similar. the similarities. You. you know, yeah, yeah, I can feel that. Okay, so then next year, 2012, mm -hmm. you actually got suspended uh, for not showing up to a game. Yes. yes. What happened? Um, man. Uh, so, uh, being RB one, being the starting running back. Uh, it was the week we played Baltimore that was coming back off the ACL. Uh, and, you know, I was doing my best. I had uh, some solid games, had some up and down games. And we were going into a game against Baltimore where I had prepared the, the week of practice and done the whole thing, got on the flight, got to Baltimore, and there wasn't a uniform in my locker. Uh, just say, you know, jogging suit, sweatsuit. Something I wasn't anticipating. Um, something I'd never seen before. And something that, like, did make sense to me. Because I'm like, man, somebody could have told me. And I remember um, when I told my running, when I saw my running back coach in the locker room, uh, Kirby Wilson, and I was like, yo, um, he was like, man, that's that's not good. That's not right. And he was like, uh, take that personal. Wherever that call came from, however it happened, uh, that's what happened. Went to Baltimore, saw I didn't have a uniform. And so that means I was going to be standing on the sideline <laughs> uh, in the sweatsuit looking like Boo Boo the Fool. And I, I ain't never been there before. And my running back coach said, no, nah, that's, that's not how it should have went down. The very next week, I went to practice, playing prepared. 
And then on that Friday, I asked, hey, am I suiting up this week? Am I dressing this week? They said, no, you're not. Okay, no, I'm not suiting up in a game. So when it came to that game against the San Diego Chargers, I didn't show up that Sunday. I wasn't in the locker room. That was my statement to the team for not having a uniform put in my locker the game before. As a professional athlete, you put your body on the line. I've carried so many, I've carried so much for this team to this time. Um, for my business, for my man, for my personal, I felt like I deserved the respect of a, of somebody letting me know. So same way they didn't let me know when it came to that game and I knew I wasn't dressing, didn't let them know I didn't show up. And that was the trade-off. And we've not showing up to a game for a thing. It's just like, okay, you can't just do that. So now you're suspended. I'll take that suspension. Uh, I, I made my statement. Right. Um, you. I never, so that's, that's something that never came out until right now. Okay. Yeah. Nobody knows that story. Yeah. In retrospect, I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're still a professional. We all have of feelings, of but course. there is no single player in the, in the NFL is bigger than the whole league. This oh, is a no, multi-billion no, dollar of course operation. Not. So, yeah. you know, right now in 2024, when you look back on it, do you feel mm -hmm. like you could have handled it a little bit differently or would oh, you have still nah. done it the same way? Hell yeah. I okay. did that the same way. <laughs> because as a professional, you got you got the right and responsibility to make a statement on who you are, what your value is, what your worth is. Like, you tell your boss exactly what you're worth. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that was my professional statement. That ain't no shade to the team. I'm not playing today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It ain't no disrespect to my guys. They know what that is, but it's like, at that level, for for those contracts, for what you do on that field, this is your life still. It's like, motherfuckers are getting hit. This is affecting like our lives for the rest of our lives. It's like you have to make a statement on 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 who you are as well, professionally. Otherwise, like any and everything can happen to you in that game, in that sport, for such a dangerous sport and in a high earning business. Like, yes, at as an athlete, you don't have, especially at this time, there wasn't no social like that. You don't have very much of a voice for yourself. You don't have too many people fighting on your, so one of the few things you can do as an athlete in the NFL is decide to show up or not show up. That may be one of the only tools you have to, to stake your claim. So no, I do the same exact thing. Okay. So you would have done it exactly the same way. Exactly the same. I'm, I'm proud and impressed with my younger self for, for having the, the, the cojones to stand on that. Okay. Now, was it earlier that season you actually tore your ACL? Um, it was the end of the 2011 season. So uh -huh. so it was the last game of the year before. Oh, the year before. Okay, so I okay. was coming back from the, the torn ACL in 2012. Got it. And yeah, a torn yeah. ACL in sports is one of the most serious yeah. injuries. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, people coming back from a torn ACL is the exception. One. It's yeah, not the rule. This is why, like, with Kobe, it was such a big deal. Yeah, yeah. It used you know, to be a career Kevin ender. Kevin Durant, such yeah. a big deal. Yeah, yeah. It used to be a uh, career ender. And, exactly. And when the when the uh, it of, still is, I think. I mean, oh, depending oh, no, on how of, things go. The the when the medicine and and training is updated so much, where there's kind of a a, a process a regimen of how they they know how to come back from torn ACLs now. Oh, so these days they could actually fix it. These days, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. you can kind of come back and do better. That okay. was at the time where that was still improving. So that. They used to be a very, very uh, detrimental injury. And now you can kind of, they got a program where you can make it through now. Uh, so, I mean, so it, but it's still a steep injury to be coming back from. And that's where, uh, where I was in 2012. I mean, were you freaked out when you found out you have a tour ACL? Did you think, okay, this is it. <laughs> no, I, I so, got to go find a job. Like. <laughs> yeah. No, so it's funny because when it happened, it was so mild. Like I was just, I was running and going to make a cut uh, in week, week 17 against the Cleveland Browns. I was on the right side going to make a cut and I just felt like a little jolt. And I'm like, man, that was, that was weird. And I was sitting down for a second. I'm like, huh? But I got up and I walked off the field. I went to the side. And so when they first told me I could, cause it was so mild how it happened. Like they tested my knee on the, on the little, now they have a blue tent, but then you were just out of the open. They tested it. And then Dr. Bradley looked at me and said, you, you tore your ACL. And I'm like, no, that no way. That that was so. I'm like, you you tripping? I feel like I can go out there and play right now. And he was like, no, it's <laughs> it, it would stop right here. It's not stopping. So I didn't I didn't because of you know so much happens on that field. I didn't I didn't get the magnitude of it until I went into the locker room, and I was laying uh I was laying in a training room on like uh on, on one of the benches on one of the gurneys, and it hit me when after the game when my teammates came in, 
Cause then guys were walking in and Hines came and he gave me a hug and like a kiss on the forehead. Coach T came in and grabbed me and kissed me. And I'm like, wait, so they started, they were treating me like I was like dead or something. And that's when it hit me. And I started bawling. I started crying. I'm like, wait, is this like, uh, like I felt like it was a funeral when the game ended. <laughs> and so it, it, it really kind of settled, like settled in then. So that next year you actually got traded to the Arizona Cardinals. Oh, uh, not traded. My uh, five year was complete. Okay, so your contract was over. Twelve contract was but over. But they could have renewed it. They could have resigned or renewed it. Uh, they left it at that. We left it at that. Was it over not showing up to the game? You think did that leave a sour no, taste? No, I think. Left? Um, uh, no, I don't think so because okay. um, because our relationship was. You know, I I met with Coach T after that. Our relationship was shored up. I think it's um, you know, in the NFL around this time, five years from a running back coming off the ACL. Maybe they felt like they could go younger or kind of find find a new RB in the draft. So I think it was just kind of uh, I think it was more sport reasons. Um, and so went to free agency and then signed with Arizona Cardinals via free agency. Right. You got two and a half million. Yes. Um, it was a uh, two and a half guaranteed mm -hmm. with the ceiling of three and a half million if I hit certain incentives, like a thousand yards. Up to that point. Um. Uh, You'd made about ten million, ten, eleven million or so. Uh that's that's a good uh uh guesstimation. Yeah. But I actually I hit all the incentives. So I saw every bit of that twelve point five five. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I had the seven guaranteed. Right. And I played for five years. You got the twelve and, and a half. So I got twelve and a half. All of it. So up to that point before you went to the Cardinals, mm -hmm. is your money situation straight? You're financially oh, yeah. responsible. You're not <laughs> yeah. I was living in the, I was living in the same townhouse driving the same Jaguar. Same at, Jaguar. at this point I um I added a Lincoln as well cuz it's snowing it's hills in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. So I had a um $34,000 Lincoln MKX. Mm -hmm. Um so that in the Jaguar. Um so no, I was still in that same 290k townhouse when I found out I was going to Arizona, I sold it for 360. So I made 70k on my way to Arizona right. living in the same townhouse for my rookie year. So no, I was in a um, very very um fiscally responsible, very financially positive situation. I mean, were you investing your money along the way? Oh, absolutely. In uh, what way? Yeah. Uh, I had a uh, 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 financial manager and have a portfolio that was pretty diverse. So okay. it's kind of like a, the snowball effect in my mind. You take like a snowball, well, yeah. roll it down a hill, and it just kind of builds and You're collects. talking about Warren Buffett. Oh, is that right? I, well, I didn't know that was Warren Buffett. His book is called Snowball. That is was that the right? book that, that changed it, my life, actually. But yeah, you're that's right. That's crazy. Investing my, uh, in stocks is like a snowball. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just had the snowball going. Compound and I interest. Didn't. Exactly, exactly. And th and that's where I tossed what I had, kept a, kept a little bit on me, and kept going. So so my compound interest, my money was building still. Smart. I love it. I love when people actually have this type of conversation as opposed to- I feel that. Damn. <laughs> you know, yeah, I invested yeah, in this no. label, and yeah, you know, I put 10 million in that, and then they ran off my money, <laughs> and then my financial advisor ripped me off because- you never really got ripped off by your financial advisors. Nah, I took I took time to make sure I found uh, my guy. Because uh, early on, I remember, um, and it was kind of uh, silly, because when I first, um, I, I wanted to invest, like, first off. So I remember going to the bank and getting a CD. And it was <laughs> like, it's like, I put like 300K, and I think I got like 6,000 or something yeah. on that. <laughs> like something small. But um, but I, I wanted to wait to really do due diligence before I found my financial advisor. And when I finally did, um, uh, that man, Kevin Peters, like, is, it's been awesome. We're still rocking to this day. Love so I, I've had one guy, and uh, no, he's never done me. Yeah. I mean, investing in stocks completely changed the mm -hmm. trajectory of my life. Totally. Like, I don't even want to think if I didn't invest what I'd be doing with my money. Not really. And annuities and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So now you're playing for Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a solid year. Uh, you had eight touchdowns. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And at the end of that season... Were they looking to sign you again? Were you a free agent one, one more time? Or um, I think at that, uh, I chose to to walk away. Well, um, well yeah, and I, I yeah, understand yeah, that. Yeah. But I'm saying leading up to that, were, were there offers on the table? Oh, from... no. So there was a, so I had the one-year deal in uh -huh. Arizona. Yeah. Um, and, and through the year, through that year, I was kind of like mulling the, the you know, my football like life and, and longevity if I was going to still be going. So at the end of the year, you always have a meeting with your head coach had the meeting with Bruce Arians and they were kind of along the lines of uh, obviously uh, Andre Ellington was a rookie, my backup. He was doing pretty well from the outside standpoint. The fans maybe probably wanted to see more of him. So when I had the meeting with BA, he told me, you know, you did a good job this year. Solid. Um, did what we asked you to 
you know, maybe we would have liked to see a little bit more, but we're going to go into um, our off season, think about what we want to do, weigh it. It was just kind of like very, uh, a very gray, you know what I'm saying? Like very, but I told him uh, in that same meeting where uh, I felt like it was complete for me. And I even said it in an article where he said, I told him I wanted to write books or something in that meeting where I told him um, I'm kind of seeing my life uh, apart from the game more so than I am for it. So I, I told him actually in that meeting that I was going to retire. Because I remember um, after our meeting, sitting, I was sitting in the Jaguar looking at um, <laughs> looking at the field and my wife was there and I'm like, and I, and I stayed there for a long time just to look out the field. And we both knew like this was over because I told BA that like I was going to pursue writing going forward. Well, you're 26 years old. Yes. Yes. And you have teams that are interested. Yes, because my agent was getting calls through yeah. free agency, via free agency. You could continue in football. Yeah. I actually looked it up. The oldest football player to play was 42. Yes, yes, yeah. You can keep going. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You still had, <laughs> yeah. realistically, five years. Oh, almost have. Right? Uh, Maybe yeah, even yeah. 10 if you push it. Uh, 10's crazy for 10's crazy, back, but five back. is realistic, yeah, yeah, five right? Realistic, you see... Yeah. 30-year-old, no, 31-year-old football players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of my peers have done it. Uh, yeah. Running backs, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Were you, what really made you say, okay, at 26, I am mm -hmm. walking away from a sport that still wants me? Mm -hmm. So you got to think about it. Uh, even with my mom going into uh, football, she had always said that um, uh, football is like, uh, football is just a tool or a vehicle. It's not the end-all, be-all. Uh, I have a purpose in 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 this life uh, under God. So what like um, that's that's more important than just what I do professionally than football. Um, so going into the sport in the game, I've kind of always had this idea that whenever the the cloud spoke to me, whenever it felt like it was time to walk away, when it was time to go, then I wouldn't. Um, then then I would acknowledge that. So I've always kind of felt like when it was time to walk away, I would. Um, and and also thinking about professionally like if i'm if if the arizona cardinals didn't say oh we undoubtedly want you back and we want you to keep leading this team if they don't say that then what happens i go back to free agency again and i'm you know going to another team now i'm with the tennessee titans i'm wearing a weird number like 37 and at that point you they start to devalue you as a running back anyway i feel like back in the day like in the emmett smith era like jerome bettis Barry, like when you have those running back one guys you're given uh, a chance in a space to mature as a running back where in their year seven eight nine they may not have been the same as year three and four but they still they still carried weight they still evolved their play they still were um were those guys that led their team and commanded their team so i feel like back in the day you were given a chance to mature as a running back now it's like you want somebody younger you want somebody you know quicker faster right away um, so I just felt like I would have been in a situation where I'm holding on for dear life as a running back as well. Uh, so, so those two things together felt like it was time to leave. I don't know what it's going to be for me, but I'm pretty sure I'll be devalued anyway. It was, it was just time. I mean, it's crazy that a 26 year old is saying that there's younger guys that the team is more interested. You're 26. Yeah, you got it. 26. Yeah. No other career in the real world. Are you saying that, I mean, even strippers at 26 are still there. <laughs> oh, they still going. You know what no, I'm saying? For real. <laughs> for sure. You know, they're not yeah, worried yeah. about the 18-year-olds. No, like, for know, real. They still at going. At 26, they're still yeah, yeah, getting yeah. their money. Yeah, they grow women but in, body. in football at 26, you're feeling over the hill. That's just wild when I yeah. hear you say that. Yeah, yeah. Six years in the league, uh, that'll do it. So, yeah, so you're considered, you know, uh, considered an older RB. I mean, was your body feeling beat up at that point? Uh, I was feeling it. Yeah, I yeah. was feeling it. It didn't feel beat up. Like I like I played well and I was felt like I was getting stronger mm -hmm. towards the end of Arizona because in 2012, I was coming back off the ACL in Arizona. My feet were under me and I had my like my new running style. I knew who I was. I was um interior runner. I'm getting downhill and I'm using quickness in a different way. So I found my running style. My feet were under me. And towards the end of the year, I felt stronger than in the beginning. Mm. So so my body was still there. But yes, I was feeling the effects of of being an NFL running back for six seasons. Well, right. And when you retired, you didn't have a press conference. You didn't make a big nah. announcement. Nah, nah. Uh, you said you just wanted to kind of fade to black and just sort of yeah. pretend <laughs> like it didn't happen yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think uh, 
when I, cause I ended up writing a piece and I, and I think I really kind of set a trend um, in the way I retired when I wrote that piece. And because it was all press conferences until that point. And from then there was, you know, guys kind of really write, uh, write a letter now when they retire and guys started retiring. Um, even Jared Allen, I'm thinking about him, uh, riding a horse literally into the sunset. <laughs> he had a cowboy hat <laughs> and he rode a horse on his Instagram into the sunset. Um, so, so it kind of, um, guys started retiring in their own personality, in their own way when it felt yeah. right. Um, so, so I wrote about it on the Huffington Post. That piece had a lot of notoriety. That piece went viral. That was yeah. like, um, that was like, you know, for, for music artists, for rap artists, that was like my hit single as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and then from that piece where I retired at 26 on the Huffington Post, that's where I got a lot of writing opportunities. Um, uh, uh, writing agents, reaching out publishers, um, when HBO called. So that kind of really propelled me into my next life, my, my next career. So HBO called you for ballers? Yes. Yes. Really? Yeah. After I wrote the piece on my oh. retirement. Yeah. Oh, was, so it actually worked out. It did. In I, its own way. Okay. It, it, it yeah, did. Um, that's wild. That was the same exact time where they had just, they had just shot their pilot. The pilot had been picked up by HBO. So they were in the process of fielding a writing team. And then my piece goes out and the showrunner, uh, Evan Riley, he reaches out to the creator, Steven Levinson. And he's like, yo, um, we're putting our writer's room together. Have you seen this, this football player who wrote this piece? Uh, what do you think about this? He's like, oh man, this is pretty interesting. Like, it's pretty cool. And in the piece I said, I want to write going forward. They gave me a call from there and, and all the, with my agency, um, and my, my, who was representing me at the time, uh, Chris Silva, um, obviously my football agent, Mike McCartney, but on the entertainment side, um, Chris Silva, he, he gave me a call and was like, yo, we got a bunch of calls. I told you that this one's pretty interesting. It's from HBO for a football series that they're, that they're filling the room for and they want you. And there's another writer, established Hollywood writer that they're down to. And I'm like, okay, wow. <laughs> so, so had some calls with them, uh, some conversation. They had me mock write up some script and, you know, I won the job They brought me in the room. Right. So now you become a writer for Ballers yes. on HBO. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is the mm -hmm. star yes. as well as one of the executive producers. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Wahlberg. Yes, yes. Is one, one of the, the other EPs. executive producers. Yes. Uh, any interesting stories with Dwayne and or Mark? <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Um, man, the, um, I don't know why. The first one I think about um, <laughs> is just like the day it happened <laughs> uh, with Dwayne. Um, throughout the show, um, me and him have always had a like pretty cool professional relationship with me obviously him playing the football player and me being the, 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 the one like real player on the production. Oh, so you were the only player yes. in the writing room? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, early on Terrell Suggs was there with us, uh, for like a couple weeks. So it was me and Terrell, me and T Suggs, but I, I kind of was there for the whole time. Um, uh, so through, throughout like set and production and filming, I was always there and a lot of the football specifics I had a hand in. And so even between takes and things like that, um, me and Dwayne would end up in each other's space, talking, chopping it up, different things like that. Um, and even professionally, I'd always kind of like giving him his space. Uh, but it was funny. It was a day we were in Miami. We were shooting the final scene in season one, uh, 10, where Vernon, uh, he's got his deal finally, and they bring him this really big check on a platter. <laughs> um, so we're shooting that scene. We're in Miami at uh, Prime 112. And, you know, we're setting up for a shoot. And I remember being at my... Um, condo that day in Brickell. And I'm like, man, cause I'm, cause I'm, you know, this is like, we're nearing the end of production. And I got my like writing company at this time, writing production company and things are starting to get going. But I'm like, man, there's, there's a little bit of knowledge, wisdom, information that I, that I know I need who better to get it from than Dwayne. So I got dressed this day and knew that like, all right, it's time for me to pick his brain a bit. So we're at prime One Twelve. We're getting set up for a, a shoot, a shot. And it's funny cause he's sitting down at a table and when, when he comes to work, like people really give him his space and give him that respect. So he's sitting at a table and there's nobody within like half the restaurant, like from within <laughs> him. And he's got his iPad and his phone and his notebook and he's in work mode. So I remember what it took for me to, um, to like break the fourth wall to like, to, I walked over there and I like grabbed the chair. And when he looked up, he gave me like the dirtiest look ever. <laughs> he was like, fuck you doing here? Like, get away. And I'm like, no, nah, man, not today. I need to know today. I pulled the chair, sat down. He took a deep breath, put his stuff away. And it's like, 
yes, Rashad. Like, what what do you need? What do you want? <laughs> Why are you disturbing me in my work? And I'm like, all right, man. Like, obviously, we've been around each other together, chopped it up. Man, I got this company. Like, I've seen what you've been able to do. Take me there. How do I? And so he told me a bit of his story, like um, having his first team and realizing when they weren't the right team. He said he, he looked up one day. He said, everybody in the room, he just, I just looked up and I fired their ass. He was like, people that didn't even work for me, I just fired them. He had the <laughs> wrong people around in the wrong team and started over, began to put his team together from scratch and their, and their motto and their goal, their aim was world domination. So this is in like 2014. And you remember he was every single movie, every single billboard, every city, he's everywhere. Their motto, his new team was world domination. And it took him firing his old team to like, to put that in play. And so he was like, you need a team and, and, and so on and so forth. And he kind of really, you know what I'm saying? Shook my hand, gave me the game on that day. And it took me having like the, the, the nuts, the fortitude to be like, to grab that chair when he said, get away from me basically. <laughs> and I'm like, no, nah, man, I, I need to know. So he really kind of helped me out. And that really helped me to build, um, my company wants to show was going to obviously have its own habits in, mm -hmm. but we're still good now in my writing production company, what we're able to do. And even too, where I had to realize I, I had that same moment where the team wasn't really, they didn't really understand who I was, what I was trying to do. They were just there and thought they could benefit. And I had to kind of start over, get a new team. And I'm, I'm here with you right now. I got the right person, the right guys, you know what I'm saying? So we're building that same form. And he was kind of the one that set me on that course. Well, yeah, I mean, Ballers won for five seasons mm -hmm. and you made some cameos. Yes, yes. Uh, on the show. Yeah. And I advanced uh, as a writer and producer through those each of those five seasons. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I went from staff writer to story editor to executive story editor. Ah. Uh -huh. Then I went co producer, skipping uh, another line, went co producer to supervising producer. So uh, made an advancement, grew in responsibility. And now to this day, if I um, do any work in Hollywood, it's at the level of supervisor, producer, and executive producer going up. How's the money compared to your NFL career? Oh, it's, um, it's, it's solid. So the, like, obviously not the same as the NFL in the role that I was in on that show, my role in the show, but the industry of Hollywood is, is the only place that's really breaking off checks the same way as the NFL. So depending on your position, if you're the one that's, that's leading that show running, you're in the same realm and territory. And that's kind of where we set the company and built to, um, and, and I've brought myself to being a, being a ball carrier in Hollywood, being a leading person. Well, so, so it's pretty good. Got it. Well, in 2016, Kaepernick takes a knee. Yes. And it sets off mm -hmm. a series of events that we're still feeling to this yes, day. Yes, absolutely. You, know, you didn't show up to a game to prove a point. Mm -hmm. Kaepernick took a knee. Mm -hmm. to prove a point. Mm -hmm. So there are some similarities. Yeah, yeah. No, a much larger point he proved. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A much larger point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't just about money. It was exactly. About the team. It, it was, was about what was going on in the world. Brutality and everything else like that. Yeah. When you look at what he went through, and I think everyone's in agreement that his NFL career is over. I know every yeah. so often yeah, someone yeah. says something and he tries out yeah. and it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. But yeah, I think yeah. at this, yeah. at his age. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, it, it is yeah, what it yeah. is. yeah. yeah. When you look at what he did, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on it? Man, as you said, his um, his career's over, his playing career. Yeah. But his legacy, it's like, that's that's a forever statement, a forever mm -hmm. move. Thinking that um, when you take it outside of him, like thinking about uh, when that kind of idea, when that realization finally came in with George Floyd in 2020, and now you're seeing the NFL in, in every end zone is saying in racism. Uh, there's there's social uh, justice initiatives and, and the whole thing. I feel like um, in in his way, obviously, he really did have a large impact and change on the NFL. They still have um, stickers and markers to this day about what's going on in the world and how it can improve. And that that idea that was off the field made its way uh, onto the field, and he had a lot to do with that. So I feel like his legacy is 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 larger than you know, than him taking snaps now. I mean, you were retired by the time that happened. Uh, yes, yes, 2016. If you were still playing, would mm -hmm. you have taken a knee? Um, that's a that's a great question. I, I don't know. Because um, at, at first glance, um, at first glance, at first thought, just based on who I am, I would say yes. But I think about the, 
being on the Pittsburgh Steelers and when they, as a team, decided to stay in a lot. It's just like um, I, I had a conversation, uh, really long talk, deep talk with Franco Harris when we went back, uh, uh, came back for the reunions in 2018. We had a 10 year reunion for our 2008 Super Bowl. And there was a, uh, what was it, 30 year reunion for the 1978 team. Uh, spoke like long and hard with him about like, uh, about guys who, who make statements in that way, guys who uh, draw attention to, to outside um, kind of like ideas in the realm of football. And in that conversation, uh, something that he expressed where he felt like that was something that was actually pretty selfish. I'm not saying Colin Kaepernick, but like where he was saying you have this game, which is um, so pure, so singularly focused, and you have teams that come together to fight to win games. When you bring a personal idea or belief onto that field, it kind of now your teammates have to answer to that. Now you've put pressure on your front office and all these things where he kind of expressed that that was a that's a that's a selfish thing to do or selfish move. Um, so kind of hearing it from that context, I'm like, damn, man, like, and this is obviously somebody who's one of the greatest players ever play, ever play, somebody I look up to dearly. He said that and it put a different spin and perspective on things of, of, of that nature for me. Uh, and so that kind of made me think about it a different way. Um, so in the in the same vein, like thinking about what Cap did, it's like he's an icon and, and somebody maybe had probably had to do that and he did so I wouldn't step on that so for me if he's already kneeing like um I can't say where I would have been if Mike Tomlin's telling us this is what we're going to do I can't say that I would have bucked the system or the team and took a knee as well you're just like I don't know and I, and I wasn't in that position well in 2018 Antonio Brown who is still mm -hmm. on the Steelers at this point yeah and like we said earl earlier, you were there when he first got there, and you guys yeah. had your relationship. Did you continue your relationship with yeah, Antonio after you left the team? And Absolutely. Everything? Okay. Absolutely. Well, he gets into an argument with Big Ben, mm -hmm. and then was it was it an argument or like a cold war? <laughs> was uh, it like, I'm it not was, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because you know there was, there the, was the details are fuzzy about they are, this, right? They are. Um, it's not as like, players, we're a little like yeah, yeah. I'm a little everyone's closer secretive to about it and yeah, everything yeah. else like that. Yeah. Uh, he ended up skipping some practices leading up to week 17, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he gets benched. Yeah. And he basically says at that point he wants to be traded and everything else like that. Yeah. Now, after that, you actually made some statements mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Ben. Oh, yeah, most of And this is what you tweeted. You mm -hmm. said, all right, I'll end the mystery. B's racist. Antonio Brown is black. Mm-hmm. He had to catch balls from a racist quarterback. Every player knows it. It's not a big deal. He was just supposed to take his licking and move on like a slave for real. Yeah, every honest player knows it. Um, so Ben yes. uh, Roethlisberger. So I said B because B represents a larger idea that starts at Ben, but it's a larger thing. Okay. Um, Antonio Brown playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. The all the So I'm trying not to make this my my point of view, but like the the negative attention, the people talking down on his name, the people saying he's a diva a guy that he's not. Where's that coming from? It hurts. It kills when it's your own fan base. The same, the same fans, the same team, the same people that you are performed for and supposed to. And even your quarterback, like supposed to have your back and be tight with, it's just like, what if they're not there for you? And I like that, that when I wrote that tweet, I put myself, cause it started, if you see the tweets before it, it started with like an impassioned defense on behalf of Antonio Brown, because like you said, it's kind of murky what those details are. This is an issue between two men, between two players, two football players, but we're only hearing like one, one's bad, one's wrong, like one's tripping. And the other one's just like clearing this. It's between two people. Before he left those practices, when, when, when the stories are coming out 
that like the quarterback's throwing the ball at his feet. They're saying like, like he does to rookies when they don't know what to do. When they're saying, get somebody else in here. And Antonio Brown's a, I don't know how many time pro bowler. He's number two in the top 100 in the entire NFL next to Tom Brady. Get somebody else in here. They're in film sessions and he's being like berated by his quarterback, by that same guy. It's just like, who has the power to demean his own teammate? Who has the power to like, okay, to, to stand above the team? We know there's quarterbacks and it's, to stand above the team and say, okay, this is how I want things to go. Or to like, honestly, I don't know how else to say it. Like to, to have a football in his hand and say, I control whether you get this ball or not. Like I control where your career goes and not. This is something that wasn't just with Antonio Brown. Le'Veon Bell spoke to this when he was leaving Pittsburgh. It's hard to be a hero in a city that treats you as a villain. Where he said when he was talking to the Jets, he kept going like this, where he felt like he was placed on the same level. Where coming from Pittsburgh, it was kind of like a little bit of this. It's like to Emmanuel Sanders for offensive players in the city of Pittsburgh feeling like, what does it take for us to be held in the same respect or the same regard as just like other players on this team? Uh, it seemed like there was something going on that didn't have to do with football, that had to do with a personal placing and positioning. And I was saying, who has the power to do that? And um, without disclosing too much, um, Afterwards, I said, B's not racist, just like AB's not a dirtbag. It's not about any person or anything being racist. That was the word. That was the shape. I draw shapes, all right? To wake people up enough to say there may be more here going on than like, than what meets the eye, than what we're being told. If it's two men, how does one get away scot-free and the other one's an issue? And to this day, Antonio Brown's whole story, he pissed his own career away. He, it was all fucking him. It was all him. Now, when he came in in 2010, I'm the Steelers starting running back. <laughs> what our relationship was, big brother, little brother. I, I could really get teary. That's my little bro, man. Like, for real. And so if the entire world turned on this man, nigga, I can't. I won't. Even on some, like, Chicago, we some street shit on street code. At what time I'm going to fucking switch up or get brand new? If he don't have no protection in this world, then there may be one person still Number 34 on the Steelers that first put his arm around him in the first place. Nah, man, my dog, my dude didn't do this on his own. But who's going to say that? If there's a narrative in the, in the, in the sport, in the game, that, that, that protects one and leaves the other, okay, where's this defense coming from? From the time I was a kid, man, my, my friend Pablo Shukin getting picked on, kids on the bus, I'm like, if you're going to pick on him, play with me. I've always been a protector. I've always been a defender. Like, and I'm seeing... Not, not just my fucking friend, maybe my best friend, not just my close friend, but a brother, a guy I went to war with, and literally one of the best players of our generation, mm -hmm. literally maybe the best player of our generation. How did he just, he just did himself? He just stopped showing up to practice for no reason. He loves playing football. He just stopped showing up to practice for, for no reason. Like something happened. And so you take a receiver whose job to receive, he picks the ball up and throws it back at his quarterback. He's not, why did he do that? What's really going on? And this is something I've felt and experienced from Ben that other people have. Like, this isn't nothing new, but it keeps getting pushed away and it keeps getting buried. It's just like, all right, what about us? And so like, yeah, that was like, like this, that was a defense, man, for like my personal, my brother. And it's like, I'm not going to lie. Like at that time, the way he was getting dogged out, that tweet like shifted they shifted a lot. Like it kept uh, 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 some of the heat and that narrative off of him to be like, okay, what if we're not in Pittsburgh? What if we don't work at that facility? What if there's more to the situation than like, than what meets the eye, than what we've been told, then, then what? And so that was just a, a statement to this, like, yo, there's more going on. And I, and I canceled racist and racism because it's like, I said B because B is an idea. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's the funny part. I never wrote Ben. I didn't say that man's name. I never wrote the last name. I put B because B is an idea. 
if your if well, your team but yeah but no, his no, first no, name happens no 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 of course I know I know you're talking playing. about the situation right. no no of course but I'm yeah. just like if if the same the idea is if the same place that's supposed to have you doesn't have you then yeah AB is gonna want to get gone why is he trying to get out of like trying to get traded away from from the Steelers mm -hmm. if the same place that's supposed to have you doesn't have you why is he getting gone why is Le'Veon leaving like why like what's going on and it's just like that's one of those things you can't or not supposed to speak to but like. That shit really got out of hand. Okay, well, Ben Roethlisberger was the quarterback before you even arrived to Pittsburgh. Yes. And the whole time you were there, he was a starting quarterback. Yes. So let's talk about rough ideas or whatever else. Have you mm -hmm. personally, dealing with Ben, seen any racist moments that you were like, kind of like, huh? Yeah. So to answer your question both ways, there's no way I would put that label R on a person, on a thing and say, he's this. Cause that's, that's a harsh thing to do. You ask me if I experience placism and levels like this, that can feel like the R word. Hell yeah. Mm. Hell yes. Okay. Can you talk about a specific situation where you were just like, I can't believe he just did that or said that. Uh, that's something I, I, I wouldn't want to bring to this platform. That, okay. that doesn't feel fair because what's 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 in the sport, what's in the game, is in the game. And that's something that's between us for us to hash out as individuals. What's public, like my tweet, and what's made public, I'll address what's public. But what's internal, uh, that line can't cross. So that's as far as I can go. Okay, fair enough. And, and I think that people, you know, really gravitated towards the one part of the tweet was he was mm -hmm. supposed to take his lickings and move on like a slave for, for real. real. Yeah. And, you know, for example, Kaepernick, when he did his Netflix uh, yeah. documentary, he compared the NFL Combine to slave yeah. trade. Yeah, yeah. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel, and, you know, a lot of people had a problem with it saying, well, mm -hmm. slaves don't get paid $20 million. Dollars. They yes, can go and move whatever yeah. they yeah. feel like it. Yeah, yeah. Some people sure. thought that was really a jab and, a, sure. and unfair, but here yeah. you are bringing sure. up the slavery thing when it comes to the NFL. For sure. Um, that's an idea that's been, that's been, that's been, uh, explored a lot. Like there's been books written about it and it's like, obviously not straight away at the surface level. It's like, man, we volunteer to do this. We love the game and the sport of football, like we're well compensated and taken care of for this game. We wouldn't have an opportunity to change our lives, families' lives, feed our families. Like, um, for a lot of us athletically without this game. So that's obviously, um, can easily be done away with, but that's like, that's at like face value in a deeper tone and sense. It's just like slaves, um, being respected for their physical prowess and not for their humanity and not for their minds and not for the fact that like they come from parents and homes and they're human beings. I, I watched my, I watched my best friend be dehumanized. Like I've myself felt like. I'm being for real. The where a lot of this has to do with, we're both football players. We're both teammates. What's the difference between me and a quarterback? He throws the ball. He has to remember a little bit more of the playbook. That that makes one person here and the other one here. It's just like, in the way you're treated, in the way you're dehumanized, in the way you're disregarded, in the way you're a physical specimen, like, in the way your family don't matter outside of this Christmas party, like, hell yeah, there's a bit of that. And so... That idea has stuck around and been explored for reasons. Um, and it's not, for somebody that's not, um, even not intellectual or not trying to look at it other than a deeper sense, if you just want to eat popcorn, <laughs> drink beer, watch football, go ahead and do that. That's fine. But like, it, it, if Devontae's perfect hit on Antonio Brown, if he gets hit and goes black, and has to wake up in a hospital bed and see his lady and have to remember what his lady's name is, that he could have not woke up. It's just like, yeah, he might care in his human about how he's being treated on a team. So it's just like, when I didn't show up that game, it's just like, yeah, my humanity matters too. Because if my humanity is not respected, I can't even go out here and give myself, give my ACL, give my scapula, give my AC joint, give left index, fucking left pinky, fucking uh uh left l4 toe lower back i couldn't give my myself my shit to this game 
if I know I'm not being respected at a base level. So like, yeah, that's there too. I mean, unfortunately, it's like that through all of entertainment and all of sports. You know what I'm saying? At the end yeah. of the day, whether you're a rapper, a singer, a football player, a baseball football player, football is dangerous. Or basketball. Well, yeah, football is probably. Really no, you're right. Dangerous. Football is the most football dangerous really out of dangerous. all the ones that I mentioned. Really dangerous. Except for maybe being a rapper. Yeah, that's <laughs> 2024. <laughs> yeah, that's different. <laughs> yeah, no, you ain't lying. You know, football you players aren't getting shot yeah, no, they're, by, they're by an opposing team no, because, you're right. you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the rivalry is <laughs> getting a little intense. No, you're right. right. They rap. <laughs> football and rap. Right. Too much dangerous sports, exactly. for sure. Well, after the Antonio Brown incident, with the Steelers, he goes to the Raiders, mm -hmm. where he allegedly called the general manager, uh, Mike Maycock, a cracker. Yeah. So he gets to, he gets to, he's been in Oakland for two weeks. Right. Do you think that's really for the GM? Is that him to see where, is that really for him? Or he's just caught up in, was that for somebody else? <laughs> was that for somebody like I don't here? know, because it was bizarre. It was Wasn't bizarre. It? And now it's, it's, of course it's bizarre. He, he be using that word now. I don't know if you see it. But of course it's bizarre. But I saw that. I'm like, man, he, he's got a new life. He just got to the Raiders. Like, they're just getting to know each other. Right. That that They talk about, like, like trauma, like PTS. Man, I don't think that's for somebody in the Raiders. I think that that was just, like, withheld. I think that's, like, whatever he felt like, whatever he was going through, whatever got shaken up in him, now it's coming out. Now it's coming out. That's that's how I saw that. I don't, I don't know what they did in Oakland to, to, yeah. to cause that or create that. Right, because it was chaotic. It was yeah. there was a whole cracker incident, and then he has to be released. Yeah, because I guess they avoided a, a guaranteed money situation on yeah, his yeah, contract. Yeah. yeah. So right before he was about to have his guaranteed money, mm -hmm. he gets released by the Raiders. Yeah. And then he joins the Patriots with oh, Tom he, Brady. Yeah, he he wanted to be released by the Raiders. So right. in the midst of all of this, it's like. This is this is one of the things that 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 irk me. Like in real life, is is mental health. When people say, "Oh, mental health," and okay, when it's actually showing itself, like where's that grace? Where's that understanding? Where's that respect? Like you have you have social now, and it's just like I don't, man. I know how I be feeling. I don't know what it's like to have a couple million followers. There's millions of people who got a bone to pick where they be, and the things that are being said to. Them, I've seen a little bit of it. The things that are being said to him and done. Where's that place in this mental that he couldn't have not been talking to Mike Mayock. He could have been talking to the people that he sees in his phone. And that was the only person in front of him for him to say that. It's just like. For what I've been through myself post football, when I stopped playing to think about a guy who's live playing and Tony Brown still in the NFL at this time, mm -hmm. he's still running and tracing balls. He still had to wake up from a concussion. He's still, and he's got, he's a, he's a social star. So it's like, he's still got all of this on his phone and device. He's in real life with whatever he feels, however he's going through. And it's just like the, 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 the mental health aspect of it that we deal with when we're done playing. It's just like, all right, he's not, he's not, he's not having that grace or that, or that space. Or like when he goes to practice and has a trainer, like, all right, do they have like a, a, a psychiatrist or somebody to be like, Hey man, like, where are you at? I feel like we saw, like, and and contributed to and added to the unraveling of not a soft person, but like a, a dog ass nigga, G, like for real, to, to be one of the greatest, to be where he came from in Miami and Liberty City and who he is and how he is and like what was going on. I felt like I saw that it was just combustible. And so it was starting to combust. And then in Oakland, and I know that like professionally, when he realized in Oakland, like maybe this team wasn't going to be a contender. Maybe the only thing in my career that can redeem me is a Super Bowl, like a championship. It seems like that became his professional mind. And so I have to get somewhere where I got a chance. Then he got with Tom Brady at New England Patriots. Well, yeah, he gets with Tom Brady at the Patriots, but then he gets cut by the Patriots after a after few games. The, oh, no, after the, after the, um, the, the text message alleged stuff. text messages and exactly. the whole thing. And uh, the, yeah. Right. And then when Brady goes to the Buccaneers, mm -hmm. he joins Brady in yeah. the Buccaneers once after again. a year out of the league. Exactly. After going to visit Dion on his lake. Yes. After, <laughs> after, uh, after, a after lot. running ghost routes at random parks and playgrounds in, in, a, in a ghost uniform. He Remember, there was that period of time where it seemed like there was no way in the world he was going to get back into the NFL. Right. But um, he, he not only he got back got in the back. NFL, but he won a Super Bowl ring. 
Yeah. With Brady. Like he had aimed and intended. He got with Brady and they did that. Right. But then on January 2nd, 2002, mm -hmm. third quarter. Yes. When the Buccaneers were playing the Jets, mm -hmm. an argument ensued in the sidelines. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He took off his jer jersey, shoulder pads, gloves, and shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just ran off the field. Yeah. Is that is that where it started, though? Like, it didn't start in that well, game. From what I understand, it was about money. It was about, I guess, he had something in the stipulations, because he wasn't being offered these long-term yeah, contracts. Yeah, he was yeah. being offered very limited contracts. Oh, no, that's one aspect of it. After money comes into play, so when he gets back, he has to serve that eight-game suspension, mm -hmm. and then he plays the second half of the year and the playoffs when they win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, after they win the Super Bowl, what Bruce Arians was saying about Antonio Brown's time with the Buccaneers his first year, man, he was a model citizen. Everything we asked, he, he we asked him to do, he did. Like the impact he's had on his team, the winning culture he's bought, that was the, the tale after his first um, year. So you have second year, uh, year two, and there was the, the the COVID card incident. Right. He faked yeah. his COVID card. Yeah. Were well, they saying allegedly? I don't know. But yeah, there's people who want to take the <laughs> who want to take the shot who don't. Okay. Whether you had a card or not, and whether uh, whatever other people, that was the the incident. So he wasn't having the same issues of being being outbursts and explosive or this and that. That was a COVID card thing in which the league found him for and suspended him for. He served his suspension. Then the game before he stripped off his pads, uh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, their top two receivers, are out uh, due to injury. He plays in that game and has like 10 catches, 101 yards, touchdowns, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, balls out. After that game, when he takes the podium, um, uh, uh, we're talking about money, we come back to it. When he takes the podium, I remember watching his press conference and they're speaking about him forging that COVID card or the issue he's been on a team. And his kind of take was like, yo, man, why you, you guys write these narratives? I have no control over what you say, but we're moving forward now. This is about football. I just played a game. Why are you trying to speak to me about things outside of here? It felt like at this point, now the media is out of line at OC. When somebody serves their time, they paid their penance, it's over. They're still bringing the drama when he's not brought that drama to Tampa Bay, they're still bringing the drama to him. And that COVID car was enough to say, okay, he's the same guy. It's this, it's that. And they're stoking that same fire that was left in Oakland or even New England and with Pittsburgh. They're stoking that fire and trying to bring it here. And so when it comes to that next game, as a player, it just seems like What Antonio Brown is one to know, it's like, as he said, his ankle hurts. He's going out there. Man, do do these guys have me in my in my head? Because once again, you got to remember, all the headlines aside, this is one of the best players of our generation. So in his mind, if he knows, I'm Jerry Rice, like I'm coming off the bench, like sixth receiver, and my ankle hurts, and we can be saving me for the playoffs. Like, do you guys have me out here? I'm going in the game, and Tom Sandy's going to get me the ball, and I'm not getting targets. It's not just about being selfish and I want targets. Am I getting targets? When he came back for that second year, he was on a prove it deal the first time. And he was like, okay, so I, I proved it. I helped yeah. us win the Super Bowl. Like you guys broke Gronk off like, like proper after this. Where's my, I'm still on a, like a, a vet minimum deal. Like in my, in my Antonio Brown to you or no, nah, in my head, like, or not. And by that point, it seemed like he got to a point where for whatever reason on the side, like the way he was being spoken to, this is when he speaks, I listen. Like when he's talking, I listen. I don't just ignore him. When the world speaks, I'm listening too, but that shit don't always seem to align to me. And so when he's like, okay, I'm I'm coming off the bench. I'm playing on this hurt ankle. I'm not getting the ball. Like, no, nah, I think I'm going to sit this one. Like, do you guys have me? No, F that. You're going in the game. Okay, so it don't seem like you have me. I'm out of here. I'm better off on my own. Well, yeah, he takes off his pads and his shirt and yeah. leaves the field. Um, that reminds me of the, who was the gymnast? I'm not sure if it was, um, the gymnast, uh, it Simone Biles? was it Simone Biles that, that was, she said she, she had like the twisties and she didn't want to perform where she didn't was feel she, she right said, to yeah. go out there. And yeah. then she, she kind of protected herself. Yeah. When I saw that story, that's what, that's what AB's reminded me of. 
Westbrook, but she right. also didn't take off her shirt and storm off. <laughs> so, no, you know, of the course. <laughs> oh, of course. Of course. Oh, that would have been interesting but to I watch, mean, but I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. But like, I mean, in, in in football, even what he said, it's just like you you make a statement and he made a statement. Because I'm like, to this day, do we we still don't totally really know what that was or what that was about. And I'm just like, why? Why not take that man's word for it? But it's just like he's been written so crazy that like now he's being like, okay, so people don't listen to him like he's a child. He's not a kid. He's still a grown man. He's still saying something with his voice. Yeah. So now this isn't aligning. And I'm just like. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, the head coach of the Bucks, Bruce Arians, mm -hmm. uh, said he's never seen anything like that in all his years. Yeah. And he announced that Antonio Brown's no longer a Buck. Uh -huh. uh, Tom Brady in the press yeah. conference said, we all love him. We care about him deeply. We yeah. want to see him be the best. Unfortunately, it won't be with our team. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw those press conferences. They were pretty um, somber. Like, yeah, it's, they're, they're, it's like, Cass was like, ah, we don't. It's, it's, uh, Brady said it's an unfortunate situation. Like, damn, nobody really totally wants this to be happening. Well, right, because Brady brought him. To Tampa yes. Bay. Didn't he live yeah. with Brady for a while? To uh, They're saying that. Yeah. I'm AD not sure says, if it's true. I'm a grown man. I got my own crib. Right. That's what AD said. But he did, like, you know, he did put an arm around him. He did yeah. say, you know, he's, he's on a Brady program. Um, and Brady's generally considered but, the greatest football player of, of all course. time. So but who's the only person you can compare to Brady? Brady's got to throw it to somebody. Exactly. The only person in our time. They're both done playing now. Right. The only person you compare to Brady in our time is Antonio Brown. Right. Before him was Jerry so, Rice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. In that time. So it's like, it just yeah, did Brady bring him to Tampa Bay, or did his talent, his ability, his no, laurels absolutely. brought no, him to Tampa? Brady did not do him any favors. Yeah, like right, but right. No, he, he needed, needed him to win a Super Bowl, of course. Which he won. AB's talent yeah. brought him to Tampa exactly. as well, and he helped them win as well. And and so it's like that's that like as an as a player, as a position that's not a quarterback. <laughs> so I'm a guy that's lived my life. It's not a quarterback. It's yeah. like no man. This could be a little bit a, a, a little more even, um, a little more fair. In the sense that, like, yes, Brady did uh, uh, speak on his behalf to bring him to the team, and yes, he did, like, um, you know, help, help, help him in his life to 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 guide him to 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 you know, okay, let's talk and let's help you do the right things. Um, and once we get in this locker room, and 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 we're a team, um, what's happening in here? Like, I don't I don't know if that's something that the general public can simply, I'm, I'm sitting here as a, as a uniform guy for however many years of my life, feels like my whole life. Um, but it's 17 seasons, totally 18 years, uh, my 36 years, 18 years. Um, what's happening between those men within those locker room and that trust of, 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 do you have me or not? Like if I'm putting myself on this line, it feel like, it seems like that trust really ran out and, and it doesn't seem like, Tampa even wanted that to happen, but but it did, and they had to make their stance just like he did, and that's kind of like how that's where it went. Well, yeah, and that marked the end of his football career for all intents and purposes. I mean, yes, we don't know yes, if yeah, the future's sure, going to hold, sure. but no, right much. now on January 9th, two thousand twenty-four, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any teams that are interested in of course. Antonio. Uh, is that? But the thing is, it depends on how you look at it. Is that a strong moment? Like, I'll, um, a uh, personal friend of mine, former teammate, Vontae Davis. Um, he's famously known for leaving the game at uh, halftime. <laughs> he, he retired. He retired at halftime, right. and he just coach was like, you get, "He's like, no, I'm done." Took a shower, put his clothes on, and left. And some I was at a um, we were at a birthday party for for our college teammate Kevin Mitchell, and something that he said, he was like, "Son, I felt like for all that I've given football, I felt like I took my power back because I looked up and I knew I was done, and I didn't even have to go out there and play the second half." So he and it's a kind of crazy. Legacy wise, when they say Vontae's don't like he retired at halftime, but when he told me, I felt like all the power and everything that I've given football, I felt like I took it back by by in that moment by saying, This is the exact moment that I'm done. Put his clothes on and left. And as obviously as he goes through the transition, like all of us, seem like he hasn't looked back. And so so Antonio Brown in that moment, it's just like if that's the moment where he felt like or realized this game doesn't have me to the level that like I perform at that I believe that it needs to like have me, then I'm out. That can be seen as a moment of strength too. Well, I know Antonio Brown's your man. Yeah. But I've had a couple experiences with Antonio Brown myself. Oh yeah, I bet. Oh, oh no, he's he's right. that too. So he's that so too. we had one interview scheduled with him in New York. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my man Coach PR, who had interviewed him before, set it all yeah. up. And yeah, 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 yeah. Like that. For sure. He he shows up very late, which is fine. People show up late. Not a big deal. And then I get, I'm in New York. No, I'm in LA at the time. This is happening in New York. They're like, oh, Antonio wants to speak to you. I'm like, all right, cool. And he's like, hey, so can I put all these clips on my YouTube channel as well? And I'm like, well, we prefer to keep everything on our YouTube channel. I got you. Really, yeah. all of our money comes yeah. from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. He goes, all right, cool. They get a phone call. Yeah, he just walked out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. His own crew didn't even realize he had walked. He literally yeah, got off the yeah, phone yeah, and yeah, walked yeah. out by himself. Yeah, 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 and yeah, 10 yeah. minutes later, everyone realized he's not yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this happens. Yeah. Then, after the whole walkout situation, yeah. there's another interview scheduled. This time, there's going to be a sizable check yes, that goes yes, along yes. with this interview yeah, because yeah, yeah. there's a lot going on and everything to, else like yeah, that. Yeah. So I'm talking to his assistant. Mm-hmm. Okay, we set up the amount of money, everything else like that. His lawyer calls, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. We're talking to the lawyer. Okay, he doesn't want to talk about this. Okay, cool. No problem. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Yeah. This is going to be the check. I have a cashier's check. Mm-hmm. And I've worked it out with everyone, including the lawyer and the assistant, that once the interview is done, he will get the check. Yeah. It's right there. Mm-hmm. I'm in New York. Mm-hmm. Got security. My whole staff is there. Thousands of dollars are being spent on for these sure. productions, right? For sure. For sure. For sure. I get a phone call from Antonio. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's up, champ? I'm down the street. All right, cool. So as soon as I walk in, you're going to have the check for me, right? Yeah. After the No. <laughs> After <laughs> no. we're done with the yes. interview, yes. we're going to have the check with you. No, I need it as soon as I walk in. I said, this was not the agreement. Uh, Hangs up on me, never shows up. Yeah, that's right. Then I find out from his assistant that he's like, that he was on his way to a New Jersey Nets game. Yeah. That wow. was like 30 minutes after our interview. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a two hour interview. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, was he just going to take his check, give me uh-huh. 30 minutes, and then walk and be out? out. Be was out. I about to be scammed by Antonio? <laughs> so listen, me, me and Antonio, mm-hmm. we got on DM at one point and we kind of went back and forth and mm-hmm. he still wanted to do it. But I'm like, man, I, at that point, after going at that, through yeah. all this nonsense and then. Yeah, yeah. You know, he sold that one guy a couple of fake Richard Mill watches. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Which he lost oh, no. a lot, yeah. you know. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, look, yeah, he yeah. pulls out his penis in Dubai. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. a picture posted of his baby mother giving him head. Like, yeah, of course. Like, you can't just say that yeah, yeah. Antonio's a victim and everyone's just making oh, him no, look no, bad. No, no, of course not. Now, I'll tell you this. We're not supposed to be in Dubai. Where that camera is, we're not. I didn't Wait, get on the flight. You were with him? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No. The general public. <laughs> yeah. We're not supposed to be seeing what's going on in the Dubai hotel pool. That's just, <laughs> this is like the Dave Chappelle. Uh, remember that where he was yeah. like, if they asked me if they did it, I can't say he did. <laughs> but, um, but no, to what you're saying, yes, that's him too. A ton of that is, he he moves like that. He, 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 well, he which, which is fast. crazy to me because I'm like, well, you just, I mean, listen, it was a sizable amount of money. Oh, no, right? of course. I, I'm sure in the grand scheme of things, he, he'll yeah. blow it off, whatever, but yeah. There's real business that's being done, everything else like that. I can tell you personally that I've yeah, had yeah. two bad experiences with him and it makes me not want to have a third. That, that's real. That's, and, 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 that that's, respect. and that's and ultimately I'll, on him. We were all course. set up both times. Of course. So too, it's like, I've had those experiences. Every person that's dealt with him, damn near pretty much, yeah. has had those experiences. That's him. That's like, seems like a case of him understanding his own business and not understanding yours at all. And maybe not even respecting yours right. at all. And he can do that. He tends to do that. Right. I mean, do you think it's CTE or do you think that he's always just been like this and that's just his personality? Because um, people always bring up the CTE thing. Yeah. So. And as a wide uh, receiver, stuff, you take some bad You take hits. some hits. Yeah. CTE is hard to say. They can't identify that. It's like, man, that's, that's hard to label somebody that. They can't identify it until you're dead. So, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's like, but. Man, like his his story is crazy. Just just knowing this, just like just this idea, and this is even tough to say because I'm like, this ain't this isn't totally my space because he would have to tell this. But as his friend, to think about a person is just like, okay, you're single parent households. Most people grow up with a mom or a dad, a mom and a dad. Imagine not having both parents. So you he I. Antonio L. Ala, he himself, like, if his father wasn't there because he was playing ball in the league, he, and I don't know if you know the story where he, like, just this, this is, like, known, where um, he grew up, like, in high school and he's staying at different teammates' houses because, like, um, he was living with his mom 
and she had a boyfriend and like him and her boyfriend used to be getting into it. Like, like this fight on his way to high school. Yeah. And he looked at his mom and said, get this guy out of here. And she chose him. So he just, this is probably like 15. At 15, just took his shit and said, I'm gone. Yeah. Left his home and it's been on his own, has been operating as Antonio Brown since 15. Yeah. Like in, in Liberty City, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he's in his mind. Yeah. I don't I'm not counting on my mom or my dad. Like that's a, he's already in a, like, he's in a solo mind. Yeah. Sixth round draft pick. No one expects you to no, do well. Nobody treated him. Nobody stopped when he walked through the facility. Ain't nobody stopped to help him with his lunch trade. None of that. He, yeah. he even says that where it's like, well, nobody paying me no mind until I like did that shit. So he's, he's coming from a, like, a, a solo mind in a way that I think is is a little bit more extreme than most people. Well, no, I get it, and that was going to be the purpose of my interview with him. Oh, was I'm to sure that humanize shit dope. him and been to, lit. Okay, we we know about the crazy shit. Everyone yeah, knows about that. Yeah, but let, yeah. let's talk about Antonio. Yeah. This part of the story, the Liberty City. And I, yeah. I, I had researched all that. I was ready to go. For him, and it was a disappointment that I wasn't sure. able to do for this sure. interview because I thought that if I had put this out on my platform. Mm -hmm. Me being who I am, doing sure. the type of interviews I do, for sure, I think it would have shifted the perception Most and humanized Antonio Most as the person, not yeah. the social media celebrity Whatever. or the football player. Most of, you know, there are reasons for this, but ultimately, I, I tried my best. For him to not sit down with you is crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> but whatever is going on in his shit, I already did. That's crazy because I, I know exactly what you mean, yeah. especially who you are. Huh. That's crazy, but. What's going on in Antonio's mind? Like that's yeah, that's Antonio gonna, gonna be Antonio. Antonio's that's one gonna thing be you're Antonio. Gonna be hundred percent sure of. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. To Most this up. day, I mean, down to Most him up. claiming that he slept with Tom Brady's wife, and yeah. You know, so I don't know if he's trolling on that now. I think he's trolling. It, he's trolling because I mean, I they placed her and him in that vicinity for so much that he just when he made the T-shirt, yeah. he just started playing with it. Yeah, and it's like, damn, that's bogus. That's the man's wife. It's his ex-wife now. It's like that's yeah. He's, he's riding the line. Be, I mean, listen he's, after the. Posting a picture of your baby mother giving you head, I don't yeah. think you could go crazier than that because your kids are gonna have to I feel see you. that I feel at you. one point. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So no, no, it, that's, it is what that's it tough. is. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, last year mm -hmm. in December uh, mm -hmm. 18th, yes, you made a tweet. Yeah, they got a lot of people upset. You said, "I'm sick yeah. of average white guys commenting on football. Y'all mm -hmm. not even good at football." Can we please mm -hmm. replace the Pro Bowl with an all black <laughs> versus all white bowl so these cats can stop mm -hmm. trying to teach me who's good at football? Mm -hmm. I'm better than your goat. Yeah. Yeah. So this took on a whole life of its own. Uh, no, it, I remember it. Uh, on the It Is What It Is podcast with Cameron and Mace, <laughs> Mace <laughs> yeah. called this the racism bowl. <laughs> the racism bowl. <laughs> that was hilarious. They didn't even know what to do with that. That was hilarious. They called it the racism bowl. <laughs> um, uh huh. I mean, let's see. People were, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers suggested that Dave Chappelle be part of this racism <laughs> ball with the, the racial draft. Do the racial draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lot of people that made light of it. Um, yeah. Pat McAfee, um, AJ Hawk, they they took it all in their show and kind of kept it in like the locker room talk. It's like, man, I I wasn't like anticipating that it would do what it did. I just yeah. kind of like, man, I I hit a point where. In my in my own silo, like in my world and with my profile, where like I just kind of had enough, like of people bringing up the fumble, of saying different things to me, of trying to like lessen and belittle me for being a great athlete and like and my career. Now, honestly, man, like my like man, I did like I I take pride in my career and everything that I did, and like in including the 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 whatever the, the mishap or whatever people want to say to be like attacked on that front, to be like the mean, belittled, all this. Now I just kind of, and, and just, you just wake up and like, you, 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 I want to say get used to it after a while, but you don't. That was like one moment, one time where I'm like, all right, that's enough. The people that kind of like were in my mind, the people that were kind of like, I just, like I was, I was trolling heavy. I just wanted to smash them. And I wasn't anticipating it got that. Well, I never thought about like, a black white game. I'm just like, okay, if, <laughs> if if black players reign supreme in the game, would that be enough for you to stop adding me, mentioning me, like tweeting me, like leave me alone? That's all I was saying. Leave me alone. Yeah. And like, whoever you think is the best player, I'm that good. Like, I got tired of being small, so I made myself large. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, I 
I constantly, there's literally hundreds of tweets a day that basically say that I should not be allowed to speak on black issues, that I can only speak That's on- That's crazy. Yeah. Ukrainian issues yeah. or Jewish yeah. issues or yeah, maybe yeah. Russian issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should just stick to that. Yeah. Which is, yeah. that's just silly. It you is. know I mean? No black person is expected is. to only speak on black issues. I mean, they For can't sure. speak about the president. For sure. <laughs> you know, they can't. Oh, no, but we get done like that. You know how many times I've been told to shut up and dribble? Shut up and run the ball? Okay. Like when I've been, I've researched now, and studied it means the on the same thing, right? Yeah, it, it's like, mm. uh, like, oh no, so. So. Man, I said average white guys, but I wasn't speaking about them. I was just speaking to the people that keep messing with me. That's all. The trolls. The trolls. But they're not trolls. They're people that keep messing with you. Let's go back to the playground. I just like, man, nobody ever pick on me, like for real in real life. How you like, if you like walk up to somebody and say something, even being a bully, you'd have to like stand there and even see what that feels There's like. Physical and what repercussions. Made them, yeah, not even before it's physical. If you yeah. say something mean, think about like when we were growing up before all this internet. If you said something mean, you had to even see what that felt like. Right, to but be the internet is not a real place. Like so many people think that yeah. I'm just hated universally. There is rarely a day that I leave my house that someone doesn't approach me and tell yeah. me how much they love my work. They want to take For a sure. picture with me. For sure. Have their kids with them. For sure. Everywhere I go. I was yeah. in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't walk 10 feet. No, for sure. <clears throat> you know, For without sure. somebody stopping me. For sure. You know, sure. airport, whatever. So, yeah. yes, it may seem like there's a lot of hate on the internet because there's no uh -huh. repercussions for Follow saying, yeah, fuck yeah. Richard. Of course, of <laughs> you course. You suck. Of course, oh, fumble of the ball. Course. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, all of that, and they have a that. picture of a cat. And you don't even <laughs> yeah. know who they are. Yeah, for there's sure. There's literally, and I've always felt that yeah. the internet should not allow for anonymous accounts. I, I feel you. that's just something that in a society, it's never going to have a good ending. Yeah. Everyone that says, just like when I say something, yeah. there's repercussions for me saying it as DJ Vlad. For sure. If I say something messed up, I have to hold that. Yeah. But if someone with a cat they, emoji they not even says there. something to me, they go have lunch yeah. and nothing happens, no matter how yeah. foul. And I've had people yeah. say that, I hope your family dies. I hope your yeah. kids yeah. you know, die yeah. at birth. Yeah. You know, you should have been gassed with the yeah. rest of the Jews. You're a ne yeah. Neanderthal, wow. you're this, you're that, wow. blah, blah. And they have no, there's no downside, but I have to hold that statement in my heart mm -hmm. until I get over it. For sure. And you have to deal with your yeah. own version of that. Yeah. But once you react, you're always going to be the bad guy. Yeah. So Which is I what was, you're seeing right now. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, I'm not just a bad guy. There's, there's a lot of people that have been like, damn, because they've seen over time, like what I've been through. They've been a part of this. I didn't start there. Like this, this is circa like 2017, 18. I'm like, I had a, a post where I was at my tetherball court. I'm like, yo, can y'all cool out with that fumble stuff? Like, please <laughs> cool out. Like where I'm like, please, football is a team game or not. I started out like, I didn't start out like that. Just pleading for the stop because it's like, it's not those people and they saying, they, like, did you say that's crazy? Like, I, I basically just told them to shut up because like the stuff that's being said is being said, that's gonna happen where I'm feeling like it has an effect on my career, on my legacy, on like, you know, when my son wears my jersey and people start saying like stuff, it's just like, I felt like it was affecting something larger. So I don't know. And that, and that, that like defender in me was just like, all right, man, like, I don't, yeah. it's just like, I, like, like, man, like I, if, if, if you can say this, I can say this too. Just stop, like, stop, like stepping on my jersey. Right. But I mean, like, you saying that, and then it, it becomes the racism bowl that ends up yeah. turning into, well, your wife is white and your kids are mixed. So yeah. how can you be but racist? she's not though. She, she's Lebanese. Oh, she is. She's okay, Lebanese. She's Middle white. Eastern. My bad. No, no. In and that people picture, are think in that, that she's photo, she, yeah. <laughs> they found the most white looking photo. <laughs> okay. She's Middle Eastern. Okay, she's, fair Yeah, enough. she's Jasmine from Aladdin. <laughs> 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 That's my wife. And in the history of this country, I don't, I don't get beat with like, her, her father was a fighter uh, pilot. Mm. Um, uh, Nicholas Roma, and his nickname was the Arab, and they used to okay. call they call him a sand they called him a sand nigger. Like that's you know just in the inside of this other thing. So it's just like my my beef ain't with like people in in Arabia. <laughs> so yeah. Like and so so yeah, that's not the same thing. I feel like my bad. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. no but, but this is what's no, going to be said. Saying she's and white. Thank you yeah, for yeah. clearing it up. No, no, no. That's good. Exactly. That's good. That's exactly. why we're here. No, I mean, look, and at the and end I, of the day, and I know you care about that kind of stuff. Yeah, like, no, that's, that's what it is. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, though, 
you know, these types of things are very polarizing. You know, Umar Johnson saying Eminem can't be the greatest yeah. rapper because yeah. he's not African. Yeah, you know, and sure. then people point yeah. out, well, like, look at football. Yeah, no, you know, for apart sure. from Tom Brady. Of course. All the best players are black. Yeah. It was started yeah. by white guys. Yeah, same yeah, thing yeah, yeah. with basketball, same yeah. thing with yeah. golf. Yeah. <laughs> you know? How do we stop us from doing this as a country? I, I it, mean, it you know, happens. no one should stop anybody. You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. if, you know, I mean, look, one of the greatest sumo wrestlers was, I think, Samoan or Hawaiian yeah, at one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, you see yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Japan, different people Japan. from different cultures come in and dominate certain fields that they Absolutely. have nothing to do with, they don't yeah. have a history with. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they're incredible a... white players in football. Of but course. yeah, I mean, it's of ultimately dominated yeah. by black players. And I wasn't, to clear this up, I wasn't speaking to the white players at all. And I didn't make that clear. Yeah. I said, uh, average white guys. And I said, y'all not even good. I'm talking about the average guys who don't play. Yeah, I'm like not me. talking about. <laughs> I'm the average no, just, white guy that no, has no, two, no sports ability. Yeah, just but the I can person, talk about sports. Oh, no, of course, of course. Yeah. But I'm only speaking to the person in in my shit that's like standing up here speaking to me about football like I suck when I'm like, yo, I'm the expert that's played my whole life and stood out in this game. Correct. So I'm just like, let's, let's put this back in perspective. Like yeah. there's a person who's playing fantasy that's talking to me crazy. And I'm like, dude, you suck at football. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that was the heart of it. Now, like, just how I wrote it and how it went. <laughs> the racism in, bowl, though. Yeah, the racism bowl <laughs> it was crazy. It the racism bowl. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't anticipating all of that. But like, no, I just wanted, man, I wanted to do with the beer and the hot dog to just pipe down. That's that's what that's yeah. all it's about. Yep. And and it, no, because I'm like real life. The thing about this, like, glad some real shit. Think about this though. This happened in 2011. How many tweets? This is like how many tweets have I had to see with my mentioned name at take thousands and thousands. I wrote one tweet, one, yeah. to balance out all the shit that I've seen that I never liked. This is one tweet, and it's made people up in arms and react, okay, so all I was saying is before this tweet came, why didn't anybody say or do anything when the shit's happened to me for 12 years? I said cool out. If yeah. you type in Rashard Minute on cool out, I'm like, yo, cool out for like, like okay, it, it, it didn't end. Right, so, well, but to be fair, right? Uh -huh. I ran to Kevin Gates yesterday at the grocery yeah. store. Right, me and him, that interview, like 10 years ago, we mm -hmm. haven't seen each other since. Mm -hmm. So we just got a chance to just catch up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we're sitting here at the grocery store, we're chopping it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, oh, give me your number. He's like, oh, he calls assistant over. He's like, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get her number. Yeah. She she deals with everything. Mm -hmm. I'm not on social media at all. Yeah. I have no idea what's yeah. happening yeah, on yeah, yeah. any level. I don't even have yeah. the app on my own phone. Yeah, for sure. Because for I don't sure. need that type of negativity That's in my real. life. That's right. And he was being dead honest. Yeah. He doesn't know what's going on. He yeah, knows yeah. his family, his yeah. shows, his career. Yeah, for real. The stuff that he finds important. For real. And you don't have to, if you're choosing to read these comments, and I'm guilty mm -hmm. of the same thing, it's because you're choosing to of read course. these comments. Of course. No one's putting a gun in your head and say, yeah, read this one, read oh, this no, one, read this sure, one. For sure. You're doing it to for yourself. Sure, for sure. So if you react, yeah. ultimately it's your own fault. Yeah, of course. Uh, of course. It's one man fault. talking to another. Yeah, yeah, most F. Respect. Respect. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I'm guilty of the same thing you're guilty of. Yeah. yeah Reading yeah, the hater yeah, yeah. comments and feeling a certain type of way, sometimes yeah. reacting. Yeah. My reactions sometimes get as big as your reactions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've yeah, had yeah, viral yeah. tweets. Yeah. I've had viral tweets that have gone yeah. six, seven million, you know, yeah. about video games and yeah, yeah, Israel yeah. that every Most celebrity have. responds to and everything else like that. Most I get have. it. Most I get it. I'm not just speaking from the outside. Most but have. ultimately, mm -hmm. we are putting ourselves mm -hmm. ourselves into the circus. So we can't get yeah. annoyed when yeah. there's clowns and yeah, monkeys yeah, yeah. and <laughs> no, <of course. laughs> you know, elephants of course. you know, all of around. Course. You know what of I mean? Of course. Um the uh, no, I'm I'm with you a thousand. The idea like Kevin Gates, the idea of getting off though. It's like my entire writing career was spawned through social media, mm -hmm. from Twitter to the to the Bin Laden take to me writing a blog, and then my blog with the Huffington Post getting picked up. My entire writing career has happened through social, so that's that's like the tough part because it's like, man, I'm on here, I have to take an account of what's going on, so I know what I'm writing, where I'm going next. My career was built here as well, almost like an influencer. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I'm like, how do you? How do you take a litmus? How do you understand where where your business is at without without coming across this stuff as well? And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's a tough thing. Yeah, it's it's tough.
a final question. Oh, what? your business being viral, being online. Yeah. Like how how do how would you how would you how could you how could you do what you do without understanding where your audience is, what they liked about the interview, who they want to see more of? Like you'd have to understand for to know where you're going too. I, I think we put too much importance on that part. Okay. To be honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. at for the sure. end of the day, you could be a great writer. And yeah. not go on social media. I could be I a great you. interviewer without looking at all the comments okay. Respect. and everything else like Respect. that. Yeah. We we're drawn to it on a certain way. For I sure. don't know what it is. It, I got it you. is an unhealthy thing, yeah, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. But we don't have to do that. And there's okay. lots of people that do our job that don't have to include social media into yeah. their lives. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think we kind of like the hate to a certain degree. It's, because it's, with the hate comes also the love. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You get a lot of love, yeah, then the, the yeah. hate gets sprinkled in and, you know, it, it hate, is what it is. The hate has fueled us at different points in time exactly. in the There's career and in too. the journey. Um, yeah. so playing sports and, and for what you do in the art, it, it's fueled mm -hmm. you as well and, yeah. and me as well. So it's it's tough to separate. Right. Last question before I let you go. We're about a month away from the Super Bowl. Yes. Who do you think is going? Still early, but yeah, you know um, there are some contenders. There's yeah, the Ravens, the Niners, the Chiefs, the Browns, the Bills. Yeah, maybe even the Steelers. I guess so. I can't say who's going. I'm rocking with the Steelers though right okay. now. I, I man, I love how they've come back. Um, I, I, I like who I like. I like what's going on with Najee. I, I love what's going on with Najee. Um, in, the, in their backfield. Um, man, I, I just want to see Tomlin in the Steelers. Um, right. So yeah, but who's gonna win? I don't. I can't say I've been uh, close enough watching football enough mm. to put that Fair enough. in its in its context. So I, I'm just I watch and I'm just like I'm yeah. just rooting for the Steelers, right? And the Steelers don't really have a superstar quarterback. No, but that's what's brought them to that old school, right? right. Like the Steelers '70s, like running the ball. They right. might they may exactly. come through here a different way. They may yeah. bring that old school football back, right? And Mike Tomlin's never really had a losing season, for even sure. though he didn't always have. The greatest team yeah yeah which says a lot for mike of course but even his what drives him he's been there and has had that taste the only thing he thinks about is what it would take for us to hoist that sticky lombardi i trust his mindset his point of view that everything that he's doing is to get back to that game and win that game i want to see that happen for him yeah do you think that belichick is done um i don't know i can't say um I don't really know. I'm hearing that in those whispers yeah. and thinking like something like that would fuel and drive a man like that. Is 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 it him? Is his team done? Are they like steady enough at quarterback? Um, I, I can't totally say, but no, I won't I won't throw the towel in on, on, on Belichick. I can't do that. I mean, would you say he's the greatest uh coach of all time? He's up there. He's certainly up there. Um, yeah, I mean there's it's, it's too much like there's Vince Lombardi, there's Tom yeah, Landry. Yeah, it's like George Hallis and God, I can't, it's tough to say. Um, because that's all the time. That's definitely that's up tough. there, though. He's up there. He's for he's in that conversation yeah. for sure. Well, uh, Rashard, man, appreciate you coming in and uh the honesty when it comes to everything, man. Um What's up? you know, at the end of the day, guys like myself do don't who don't have a lot of athletic ability never really did. I, I always knew that early on that I'm going to have to figure it out a different yeah. type of way. Yeah. That, you know, we can never do what you've done. Yeah. Even at, you know, the the, the junior yeah, high yeah. level yeah, and everything yeah. else like that, what you guys have pulled off yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. To be involved like. playing with some of the best players. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, Antonio Brown should be a Hall of Famer if it wasn't for all oh, the answers. For sure. for sure. No one's doubting that for sure. on any level. For sure. You know, like a, like a Pete Rose who I just yeah, interviewed. Yeah. yeah. Hall of Famer, but because of the of course. the bullshit that's being done yeah, on the side, yeah. it keeps them, you know, out of that ceremony. Yeah. But you've played with the absolute best. You played against the absolute best. Mm -hmm. And ultimately you walked away when you could have still played and then potentially risked Mm -hmm. The rest of your life being for in a sure. wheelchair, for sure. You know, Having being in a morgue. <laughs> my wife have to help me out a bit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, because you know, listen, uh, <clears throat> Warren Sapp has been a regular on my show a bunch yeah. of times, and yeah. you know, he has to write little notes to himself because he just forgets things now. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah, he yeah. feels he has CTE, whether yeah, it's true yeah. or not, yeah, we won't yeah, know yeah. until he passes. But no, for sure. But there's been lots of players. Um, yeah. You know, Evander yeah. Holyfield, who I interviewed 
yeah, you yeah. know, you could tell that the boxing, that being mm -hmm. hit in the head so many times for so many years at a heavyweight level yeah. has affected him. For sure. You know, and you see yeah. a lot of players that have sacrificed their own bodies yeah. and their own futures yeah. for a few extra games. For sure. Muhammad Ali, another for sure, one. For sure. You know, when you look at yeah. some of those interviews when he was still boxing, you're like, yeah. Why yeah. is this man still boxing? He needs yeah. to retire yeah. right after this interview. <laughs> yeah, but he's real. got like five more fights laid out. For sure, for sure. You know, and ultimately yeah. you decided that your future was more important than- Than my right now. Than your right now and a few more yeah. dollars and a few more cheers. Absolutely. And ultimately you found a second career in writing. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I really think you're the prototype mm -hmm. for the athlete of the next generation. Yeah. Man, I appreciate that. Absolutely, man. I definitely appreciate that. Until next time. Until next time, bro. Peace. Appreciate you.